matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. Oh. We're going team by team. I would be very careful about slinging stuff. Am I going to get sued? Are we going legal on this? Let's send you out on the right note. Uh, PFF sucks. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> Welcome in to the PFF NFL podcast, Steve Palazzolo, Sam Monson. We're live on YouTube, fixing every team in five minutes. We're in the middle of the series. No controversy whatsoever yet, other than Browns fans. Yeah, they weren't happy with you largely, though I'm not sure why I was getting tagged in it. Oh, because you were, you were listening. I was just sitting there in silence while you said things. Yeah, we did this yesterday. So our uh, fixing every team in five minutes series. Oh, this thing's like psychedelic, huh? This is not... It's not camera friendly. Not really? camera friendly whatsoever. Yeah. First time I think rocking it on the show here. Mm. Um, so yeah, we'll uh, might need to sunset this, as they say, mm. in the product business. Sunset this. Sunset the product. This pullover. Um, yeah. So we started yesterday with the Norths, AFC and NFC North. We like to fix every team in five minutes. We really give every team about twenty minutes, maybe more, and uh, just have some fun going through with the off season. Might look for look like for each team questions that they need to answer, and uh, fixes in quotes. Five minutes is in quotes. Everything's in quotes. And uh, the thing that went... Suggestions, quotes. <laughs> suggestions are quotes. So we're just talking ball. Um, the thing that went viral yesterday was somebody trying to say that I uh, said David Njoku was a cut candidate. I was referring to the Over the Cap article that had him on the list. I was not suggesting that Njoku was or should be cut. Um, but yeah. Somebody the, liter- literally snipped out 11 seconds of what was a... 15, 20 minute discussion on the Browns yes. and chose 11 seconds of a sentence that I think didn't even begin that way. And, and was like, oh, look at these idiots. Had to talk about how to fix the Browns because you had brought up another article from a different website that listed David and Joku as a cut candidate. We then fairly well said, well, they won't cut him because he's really good, just had a great season. But the whole thing was in a broader discussion about how much cap problems the Browns have because of the Deshaun Watson contract, even if their strategy is to, you know, kick money down the, the road and re, uh, restructure deals, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so good times. We'll, um, chances are we're going to misspeak again. Or even if point. we don't misspeak, someone will find someone 10 will seconds find, to yeah. make it seem like we did. Someone will be met, probably Jets fans today, because today is the East, AFC and the NFC East. Do you want to start in the AFC or the NFC, Sam? Uh, I, I don't care. I really don't. I tried to muster the, the energy to, to decide, but I really don't care. Whichever you want to do. All right. I think I've overcorrected. We used to always start with the Bills, and then I overcorrected, and I stopped starting with the Bills. We're going to go back to starting with the Bills. So let's start in the AFC East and the Buffalo Bills. Again, we're going to fix every team in five minutes. The history of this is we did try to do it in five minutes one time, but we didn't do it very successfully, so we just kind of ramble and, and talk ball. Starting with this division. Starting with this division, right? This is where it all started, I think, with the, uh, with the Dolphins. So the Buffalo Bills... Um, another loss in the divisional round to the Kansas City Chiefs. And, you know, I think a lot of people around the league were thinking that the Bills were in this championship window. And going into last year, there were some people who thought the window closed. But there was points in the season where the Bills looked like the best team or one of the best teams in the NFL. Going into the playoffs. Really. Going into the playoffs, right. They were hot. They had uh, make the offensive coordinator change, which may or may not have actually triggered them to get better right but they you know they went from a 500 team late in the season to like okay this is the team you don't want to play in the playoffs yeah so I think look I think the Bills are still set up to be really good next year but what's going to get them over the hump this is what all the AFC teams are trying to figure out how do we beat the Chiefs how do we get over that hump how do we do it in Buffalo yeah I mean I I think I don't I don't believe in the idea that the window is closed or is closing necessarily for Buffalo. I think they are just in the same boat as a lot of those other teams we talked about where it's going to be hard from now on because you've got the big money quarterback on, you know, a giant sum taking up a huge amount of your salary cap. On the other hand, the reason that is the case is because he is one of the most impactful players in the entire NFL. So, as long as you have Josh Allen, it, uh, interceptions and turnovers notwithstanding, you're going to be there, thereabouts. Like, they are. There's almost nothing they can do to that roster to prevent that from happening. We saw, you know, Andrew Luck drag terrible teams to the playoffs single-handedly because a, a, an elite quarterback playing at a high level is capable of doing that. So, now, yeah, you might be stuck at a level where you can make the playoffs but not win a championship unless you maintain a reasonable roster around them. But I think the Bills are capable of doing that. Like, it's not so crippling, the contract that they're 
they have no shot of, of making things happen. So I, I don't think things are as doom and gloom as maybe some people are painting them to be. Um, <clears throat> so we, I like to use over the cap because they are the most reliable when it comes to cap numbers from a team perspective or a player contract perspective. And the bills, so if you go to just cap space, yeah, it, you're, you get the teams that are in the, in the red, in the negative, whether it's overall cap space, effective cap space, bills are third worst. They also have other articles because we know teams are going to restructure and every team has different levels of restructure like you mentioned with Josh Allen when you have that long QB uh, contract you've got far more flexibility at that position but even with even with potential restructures and everything the Bills are still among the lowest teams in the league as far as potential or uh, possible cap space at the moment so I think they're at this spot where the difference is going to be like last year when you or a couple years ago when you go get Von Miller and you're and you're trying to make these aggressive moves to go and win a championship. I think they're they're going to have to be more shrewd with those moves. I think you'll have fewer of the uh, the splash plays in Buffalo. And I think every time that happens, it just puts a little bit more pressure on your drafting and making sure that you're developing young players from within who are inherently cheaper. Yeah, um, I mean. The Von Miller move, I think, is one that's a good example of something that they're unlikely to be repeating. <laughs> they yeah. took a swing at a Von Miller. You can see the case for it last year of um, he was the kind of player that could get them over the hump if he played well, and he was just totally anonymous. I mean, obviously the injury, coming back from injury. But once he was back, he just didn't factor at all. And he played quite a bit and just was, was barely there. And, you know, there's these crazy stats of, like, how much per tackle they paid him. But... Forget that. I mean, he just didn't generate pressure. He didn't make an impact on the field for them in a way that they really could have used. So he's taken up a ton of money. Um, I imagine they're going to try and get rid of him in some way, shape, or form and not repeat that kind of expenditure because that's the sort of move that now they can't really afford to make. Yeah, where else? Did the other things that are happening in Buffalo, Gabe Davis will hit free agency this offseason. Very likely. <laughs> What's that? Very likely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, he's, saying his goodbyes on social media yeah. and all and that. he's basically been more or less supplanted by uh, Khalil Shakir anyway, so it's a move. I, I don't see why they would bring him back, even if there's, they... There's know, also a lot of smoke around Stephon Diggs, you know, always. a guy that... There's always that smoke. Um, and the history there is, look, Josh Allen's rise to becoming an elite quarterback did coincide with when they got Stephon Diggs and brought him in. And not... And that's not to take anything away from the QB, but I think that's why when we talk about rookie contract quarterbacks, we there's a history here of Josh Allen had Stephon Diggs, Tua gets Tyree Kill, and Jalen Hurts gets A.J. Brown. Those things work hand in hand when you have that, you know, every level, dude knows how to get open, guy can win at the catch point, you trust factor, and that number one, true number one wide receiver. Is Stephon Diggs really still that guy? Or do the Bill because the Bills hit a point this year where they tried to spread the ball around to rookie Dalton Kincaid a little bit more. You mentioned Khalil Shakir getting involved a little bit more. There were games where they spread the ball around more and more. There were games where they ran the ball. I do think that style for Buffalo over time will 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 do them well. I mean, if you're if to me, if you want to be positive as a Bills fan and you look at 2023 and this season, I think you could say, hey, you know what? We learned that we can rely on Josh Allen a little bit less. He's still special. He could still take over games. We found different ways to win games. We had the James Cook games. We had the defense really step up in the second half of the season. So I think that's encouraging. And I, and I do think that – we talked about this the last couple off seasons, right? They can't just rely on Josh Allen on every key down. And I think they've learned to spread the wealth a little bit more. Now it's going to be a matter of – getting a few more of those pieces to spread the wealth so you have even more answers to win those games. Yeah, the Diggs thing I think is only a problem if he is actively going to be a pain in the ass about it. Like, it's not a problem. You look at last season. I mean, Diggs still had 175 targets, including the playoffs. Like, that's more than he had the year before. It's more than every other year except his first season in Buffalo where his target rate skyrocketed to the moon. Um as soon as he got out of Minnesota and sort of proved, hey, look, he can you know almost double his workload and get a similar type of player. So given other players were making plays, given Josh Allen was playing really well, given the Bills finished hot and were playing incredibly well, even though Diggs wasn't necessarily the focal point of the offense, there's no reason for him to be upset 
as on a team level, right? So if you're looking at this and saying, this has always been the kind of conversation with, with quote unquote diva wide receivers is, are they motivated by selfish uh, desires or are they just wanting, do they just believe that them having the ball is the best way of that team winning games? I think a lot of times it's the latter and it gets confused for the former, but there's no reason for Diggs to believe that what's happening at the moment isn't the optimal way of them actually winning games and, and being the best version of themselves. So the, the only way it's a problem is if he's looking at this and saying, I simply need the ball more because I'm me and therefore I'm going to demand that. If that's the case, they might have a problem. If it isn't, then Diggs is still an elite player. They found other high-end weapons in terms of Shakir, in terms of Dalton Kincaid. Dawson Knox is still there. Josh Allen, James Cook out of the backfield. This is an incredibly good offense if they keep it intact. And I, and I think all of that is, there's no reason it wouldn't be Gabe Davis leaving um, as long as Diggs isn't motivated by essentially selfish reasons. Yeah, so again, I think we do a lot of this on paper. On paper, it all looks pretty good. And then it's like, all right, you, you want to replace what Gabe Davis was. I, I see some Buffalo fans talking about the Gabe Davis experience where you're kind of in this hybrid of like, well, he, he brought a lot of value for a mid-round pick. At the same time, put the four-touchdown game, the famous four-touchdown four game in the 2021 season in the divisional round, maybe set expectations through the roof. It's like, oh, dude, this guy can be a high-end two to go right. with Diggs, and he's going to have a 12-touchdown season and be the deep threat. I, I do wonder how much they want that next deep threat, the speed receiver. Um, Shakir works better in the slot, adds a little yak ability. Buffalo wanted that a couple years ago, yak ability from Shakir. They get that from Kincaid, I think, as well. I, I think it's another year, though, where they might be looking for that legitimate deep threat. I thought Deontay Hardy might yeah, well, fill it a little bit. Maybe they give him that chance. I mean, that's the thing. Gabe Davis was essentially, it became essentially just a designated deep threat, never really – uh, did anything else like his average depth of target last season was 15 or something which is way higher than anybody else in that roster um, but Deontay Hart like they have three people on the roster currently who all have the skill set to just run deep and take the top off of defense they're not the same type of receivers as Davis and maybe they're not as good as Davis but Deontay Hardy KJ Hamler and even Andy Isabella like those are guys with legitimate blazing speed particularly if you get them off press coverage, i.e. you line them up in the slot or you line them up as uh, uh, without not being the X receiver, they don't have to worry about getting jammed at the line. Just run deep, go deep, take the top off the defense, scare teams over the top. Maybe you won't have the production that Gabe Davis has, but the threat is there. Um, for fear of – I'm not going to mention any cut candidates anymore. <laughs> for fear of the uh, fan bases – Attacking, I'm afraid. Yeah. They've bullied me. I don't. I don't want to misspeak. I don't want to get made fun of. Hmm. I don't want to get taken out of context. Uh, but I'm looking on the defensive side of the ball in the secondary. If Tre'Davious White missed the rest of the season due to injury, they traded for Rasul Douglas. Um, Christian Benford had a bit of a breakout year by PFF grade standpoint. Done a really nice job. So are they deep enough at corner that Tre'Davious White might be a cut candidate? Ooh. Um, the Tredavious White, like where where do they try to find a little bit more cap flexibility here? And are the Bills at this point where you might have the big names like the Von Miller? I don't know if they benefit from cutting Von Miller at the moment, but the Von Millers and the Tredavious Whites, the bigger names, you know, you start to move on from them for younger players. Or again, a Rasul, Rasul Douglas who came and played really well has one more year left on his deal. Yeah, um, I I think Tredavious White is certainly potentially available. Uh, I don't know if they would cut him. I think more likely is a lot of these guys are going to get restructured and they're going to play that game of, you know, just kick the money down the line type of deal. Yeah. One of the big, like, uh, missing pieces of information, if you just look at the salary cap space for teams on places like Over the Cap, is the restructure ability of these teams. Like, how much capacity have they got to move that money into future years, essentially. I clicked on one of the, one of the other articles that they have does that does show that pretty well still has buffalo near the bottom of the league yeah i mean post restructure so, but it gives you that ability like they're going to get over like being so, salary cap compliant isn't the goal here right? right the goal is to figure out enough flexibility to actually add value to your team um arjun uh, menon who does stuff for pff and he's a big data bowl guy as well he tends to post one of those you know four-way uh, graphs every year that shows kind of 
you know, how much salary cap space you've got on the x-axis and then how much capacity have you got to uh, restructure in the y-axis, right? So you end up with teams that are either in great shape, they've got a lot of space, they've got um, money to move around, teams that don't have a lot of space, but they have the capacity to move the money around, or teams that don't have any space and no ability to move money around who are in legitimate salary cap hell. And as we've said many times in the show, teams have gotten a lot better at not getting into salary cap hell. Even the teams that you think are, generally speaking, have the capacity to move a ton of money into future years, and that's simply how they play the game. So the Saints are always in that quadrant. They're, they're usually the most extreme team in that quadrant. They're always a mile over the cap, but they always have the ability to restructure, you know, a hundred plus million dollars and get under the salary cap. That's just the way they play the game. So as is this year, they are again where they normally are, the Saints as the most extreme team. But Buffalo has the what, one, two, three, fourth, fifth, or sixth, somewhere I can't quite tell. They're all close together. Uh, the amount of money that they can restructure into future years and get under the salary cap, essentially. Right. So they've got a lot more flexibility than it looks like they have if you just look at the bottom line figure and say, oh, man, they're 50-plus million over the cap. They're in, they're in hell. All right, so here's the, the next piece of the State of the Union, I think, for Buffalo is the defensive line. When I look at – I mean, it's another one of those depth charts where you, if you read all the names, there's some, some good names still there. But there's uh, a lot of them – aren't under contract going forward. So you still have Vaughn Miller and Gregory Rousseau, but Daquan Jones at defensive tackle, A.J. Epinesa, Shaq Lawson, Tim Settle, Jordan Phillips, Leonard Floyd. They, they've tried to build a defensive line that was rolling 8 to 10 deep over the last couple of years. And to get back to that, I think it's going back to that bargain basement edge defender class of, of which some of them are bills, right? Can they bring back A.J. Epinesa on the cheap? Can they bring, you know, do they want to bring Leonard Floyd back on the cheap? Do they want to um, keep some of that defensive line intact? I think that's where they're going to have to make some moves this offseason, get that depth back on the defensive line. Yeah, they, there's a lot of uh, space there that needs to be filled. Um, the Von Miller thing is, is interesting because they're kind of stuck with him without, a, uh, without an unusual deal or like a late deal. They, they can't get rid of him, um, you know, soon they can't cut him like before free agency really b before any of the offseason stuff happens there's a massive dead cap hit it doesn't save them any money in fact it costs them money to do it um they can potentially trade him and the later in the year that happens you know post june yeah. first designation saves them a lot more money so but at that point you're like well who wants to trade for von miller given what we've just seen from him uh so they may end up basically just carrying him one more year and seeing how it goes yeah i would just tell him to play better <laughs> just tell him to play better. That's what I would do. Um, which has the added kind of, like, they need him. They actually need Von Miller still. Or somebody to bring what Von Miller was supposed to bring. They're going to try and bring back Daquan Jones, I think, definitely. And he was a big loss for them when he went down yep. uh, and got hurt. So, But it is very, very thin. So I think trying to, trying to maintain, um, trying to retain some of their own in free agency, even if they're on you know cheaper, shorter deals. When we get to the draft... I've seen a lot of people, you mentioned yesterday, it's, there's a lot more tall vertical receivers in this draft that does mesh with what I think Buffalo could use to go with Stephon Diggs and Khalil Shakir and their tight ends. Um, we've seen LSU's Brian Thomas uh, attached to them quite a bit. Tez Walker would be in that conversation, not necessarily in the first, but at some point. Even Alad McConkie, not the size, but the... I, I don't think he's a slot only. I think he's a no. he's another speed receiver, speed, uh, speed and he'd quickness. Be, he'd be perfect to replace that um, Gabe Davis role. And then I do think, so to me, the back end of the first round, I think receivers in play for Buffalo, and I think the defensive line for everything that we just said, getting a little bit younger, getting that depth. Um, they locked up Ed Oliver before last season. You have Oliver, you have Rousseau, but as far as building block pieces on the defensive line, it is pretty thin. So I think going back to the defensive line well in the first round, it makes a lot of sense as well. They need a lot of depth on defense generally. Um, they're, they're another – for the second or third year in a row, they're in this weird spot where they're getting a ton of injured players back. And right. they're like, well, that, they'll be better next year because they're getting all these hurt players back, right? And they won't be – and then last year, like that was my narrative going into last season is the Bills' defense will be better because they're getting all these hurt players back. And there's no Vaughn way – Vaughn Miller, right. one of them. Yeah. There's no way they can be as injured again as they were last year, and then they all got hurt again. So – is that going to happen again? They get all these guys back, and then half the defense gets injured again, and we're still talking about this depleted, banged-up, you know, knackered unit. Or are they going to catch the right side of injury luck for a while and actually escape that? Um, one last point 
I want to make about the Bills. They have a ton of draft picks. They have ten draft picks, but they're That's the where first team. Yeah. They're the first team we've come across to be in that interesting category that Jim Nagy talked about when we had him on the show, which is day three of this draft has been decimated by the entire landscape right now of college football and the extra COVID year and blah, blah, blah. It's not a good year to have a ton of fifth, sixth, and seventh round picks, and that's where most of Buffalo's are. They have, what, two fifths, uh, three sixths, and a seventh. So, you know, most of their draft capital is on the wrong day, essentially, to have it in this year. Yeah, three picks in the top 100, which is solid, but to your point, of the 10 draft picks, yes, several on day three. So I'm curious, like, do they... Do they acknowledge that and say, this is not the year to have a ton of those picks. We need to make moves, whether that's going up to target specific players or whether that's trading back and getting out of this year entirely, you know, trading for future picks or like w- which way do they play that? Or do they even acknowledge it and just say, this is just another draft. We just pick like we pick. Yeah, I think it's a, <clears throat> it's a fair point. And I think at this point with the Bills, depth is the key, right? There's, there, I think there, they might be able to bring in several players who will contribute a little bit in year one, don't necessarily have to, but you're you're getting them ready for their second year, their third year, when they're going to need to contribute a little bit more. Not a lot of starting opportunities uh, needed to be filled in Buffalo, but it's a, it's a depth offseason, I believe. Defensive line, find that deep threat, secondary depth, young, getting younger in Buffalo. Yep. Do they, uh, are they fixed? Stay the course and, you know, just re- retool the roster. I mean, it's, it's annual, it's maintenance. Yeah, stay the course. It's it's really, I mean, just it's really tough because 31 fan bases lose. There's yeah. only one champion every single year, and even with the Chiefs, I say this all the time, right? The Chiefs, like, if you just flip two plays, all of a sudden it's like, oh, the Chiefs aren't the blueprint anymore. The Niners are the blueprint. Let's do what the Niners do. It's like, no, it's just it's a couple plays. The problem is they don't. There, it doesn't always. So that you know you. You sort of say, well, stay the course, eventually it'll come back in your direction, or eventually you'll get the breaks. Kind of like the, the concept, like poker, right? If you play it the right way, quote-unquote, mathematically, eventually the numbers will come back to you and you'll win more than you'll lose. doesn't always happen that way in football, though, because we're ta- the sample size is so small, and you can be the 90s Bills, where you can go 0-4 in the Super Bowl. Like, staying the course was probably the right call. It doesn't mean that that team was somehow fatally flawed and had no shot of ever winning the Super Bowl. They did the right... Getting to four of them in a row is an amazing achievement, but you might end up 0-4 sometime, and there's, there's no way of preventing that from happening. Right now, I think the Bills are doing the correct thing. They are in the window. They are capable of winning a Super Bowl in any given season, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen. The, the one the last thing I want to add about the um the draft picks and it might be difficult given buffalo's cap situation if they can they t- can they take a five or a six and flip that for a potential starter right a guy that's making eight right. million ten million we've seen other teams do that again you need the cap space and the flexibility to be able to do that but the, the calais campbell, the calais the campbell trades darius smith last year can you um steal a starter so to speak that also pushes the cap situation down the road a little bit more but that's another potential use of those those late round picks for Buffalo. Mm-hmm. All right, Bills fixed. Is 2024 bringing exciting or unexpected changes to your life? Well, here's a secret weapon to help you face those challenges with more confidence. It's a great term life insurance policy. That's right. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to protect your family's financial future so you can focus on what's ahead, knowing your family is protected if something else unexpected happens. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget, like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and on your schedule. You can go from start to coverage in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. So join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash pffnfl. That's meetfabric.com slash pffnfl. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash pffnfl. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company, not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting health questions. All right, Miami Dolphins are next in the AFC East. Another team, the off season. Yeah, yeah. How do we how do we beat good teams? Like these these weird questions that are difficult to answer. You just, you know, have a better team. You know, step up in big games. How do you beat good teams? Um, how much of the offensive success is the playmakers versus Tua versus the play callers? 
Uh, Miami Dolphins, they've, they've been trending in the right direction since Mike McDaniel took over as head coach for the most part, but still lost in the wild card round to Miami, I mean to Kansas City. What are we looking at for the Dolphins this offseason? Yeah, and the Dolphins are slightly different, I think, because they, they haven't shown they can beat anybody in, in any circumstances. You know, there are teams that have, like Buffalo, have, have beaten everybody they need to beat. Cincinnati have beaten everybody they need to beat. Now, not necessarily at the right time, but they've done it. They've shown that they can win those games. Buffalo hasn't beaten Cincinnati yet. Just saying. True. But <clears throat> Miami basically hasn't beaten anybody good. <laughs> they've, they've done incredibly well. They've moved in the right direction. They've been a good team. But they're in that sort of Dallas category of, yeah, but can you beat good teams? And so they've, I don't know that you can have the same analysis as Buffalo, which is you're doing the right thing. Just stay the course. Eventually you'll win one of those games. Miami, I think, does need to show – that they have another level relative to some other teams like Kansas City, Buffalo, in the in crud- at Cincinnati, if they're back to where they belong, um, you know, in, in crunch time. So they're also dealing with some turnover in the coaching staff. Vic Fangio mutually agreed to part ways, right? And he ended up going to Philadelphia. So they have a whole new defensive coordinator um, and a very new, a very different defense coming over as well. So the Dolphins are another team when you look at cap space itself 50 plus million right. over the cap they have the restructurability obviously to be cap compliant but also have cap space they have the most restructurability of any team in the nfl in terms of dollar amount but uh per over the cap second low they're going to be just above the saints in where just their possible cap space right. just where they're potentially going to be going so the dolphins and, and so the tricky part here is the dolphins did have this element of being quote unquote all in the last couple of years, they traded for Tyree Kill. They traded for Jalen Ramsey, right? They made all these power moves that did make their team better. Absolutely did. But they also haven't paid their quarterback yet. Mm-hmm. So their big offseason question is, when do we pay Tua and at what price? Right. And, um, again, the NFL analysis is just fascinating, right? Like after Wild Card Weekend, it was like, well, Tua can't win. You can't, you know, you can't, you can't win with that guy. And... Uh, there's probably kernels of truth and it's you know he hasn't shown that he could maybe compete with the big boys in the AFC or the Dolphins haven't been able to right it all starts with the quarterback at the same time what's your alternative that dude runs that offense extremely well I think he's a part of it does the system elevate him sure does he elevate the system with his anticipation and accuracy yes but yeah when you're cold weather games and playoffs can you go carry the team I don't think two has shown that yet so that makes the it's like the Brock Purdy discussion two years early here that makes it a tricky situation in Miami because once they pay him, it makes it harder to keep that roster around him. Yeah, it does. Um, but critically, it probably doesn't impact them this year. Yeah. Like even if he signs an, even if he signs a contract tomorrow and he becomes you know the, the best paid quarterback in the NFL, it's not until future years where that's going to become a problem with the salary cap. So they are still in this. I guess this is probably the last year, effectively, where they have. The benefit of a cost control quarterback. It's not like he's dirt cheap anymore right. because of the, the how deep into that deal he is. But they they have the benefit of at least relative to Buffalo, Cincinnati, Kansas City, of a much more cost control quarterback, which is why, you know, they've been playing the New Orleans game of credit card salary cap management. Um, as far as replacing starters, uh, center Connor Williams, guard Robert Hunt, both hitting free agency, depending on what you look at at the the left guard spot, uh, Isaiah Wynn, we have him as a starter. But, you know, you've had a revolving door of guys like Liam Eikenberg, Robert Jones. Like a lot of guys have played. But basically, interior offensive line yeah. is a need this offseason in Miami. Right. And, in fact, I mean, <laughs> tackle is as well. The entire offensive line is still a need. Teron Armstead is still amazing when he plays. You have to budget in the idea that you're going to need 25% of a season from a backup left tackle because Armstead won't play the entire year. And then the Austin other side, Jackson resigned. I mean, they, they brought him back, and he, right. he did improve. But the other side is Austin Jackson, who at the very minimum is not exactly the most confidence-inspiring tackle in the NFL. He so. did have the year four breakout, though. And so that still wasn't great, though. I mean, I like, know. you know, the best version of Austin Jackson we've seen has been reasonable. He's just the least of their problems now, though, which Maybe, is crazy. But, like, yeah, if that's the least of your problems, you've got major problems on the offensive line, it would be my point. Um, so they're another team that, I, I mean, I always suggest going to the free agent list and looking in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s 
on the overall list and finding some starters. Bring them all in. On the offensive line. I mean, isn't that the play? Uh, Connor Williams uh, has played pretty well at center, minus the snaps. They did have some snapping issues, whether it was on him or whether it was Tua, but Connor Williams took to that position switch a couple years ago for Miami and played really well up front. Yeah, I mean, he he was someone, I think, that had, that had moved in that direction um, before he got there, but has continued to play his best football um, for them. So absolu- I would try and bring him back, absolutely. Maybe they get priced out of that market, but like he's a player they would, I think, really want to have back and would be a – I mean, he's a, absolutely a solid starter, but they should be hammering the mid, the mid levels of the free agent offensive line market. I mean, we're going to give every single team that needs offensive linemen um, Michael Owenu, but like there's plenty, though. Like Jonah Jackson from Detroit, if he's available and you, you, his health checks out, Josh Jones would be a really nice – addition a tackle as a backup slash guy that can play six games if you need him to when Teron Armstead's on the injury report with everything um but there's I mean there's there's offensive linemen to be had and they need a bunch of them Ezra Cleveland I don't like when offensive linemen have uh grades that go down right he would he had been a solid starter for the Vikings and then coming off his worst year with a 59.5 grade but I think he's got a history of of playing pretty well Kevin Dotson's our top guard on the free agent list another one of those guys I don't know if the NFL matches our perception of Dotson I mean so from my perspective I say go you know see if you can get him on the cheap he had been solid for Pittsburgh they didn't love him but we we had him with the second best guard grade last year with the Rams and so Dotson could be a potential good player there. Yeah, Jonah Williams would be an interesting signing for them as a swing tackle slash guy that can pl- again play you know five six games for a Toronto Armstead when when that <laughs> needs to happen. Yes, um, like you know he can he's sh- I mean, okay not good play the last couple of years but he can start at either tackle spot if you need him to and absolutely back up each of them. So you know they need probably three starters in the interior and a swing tackle backup in this off season. I don't know schematically if uh, Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon, the guy that we like to give to Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. I don't know if he fits Miami or not, but there is there is some comfort in that like mid-first-round center, and he is a good center prospect. Probably, I, mean, I think he's the best since Linderbaum as far as center prospects goes. He's, he's probably in that discussion, right, as his far only, as prospects. Yeah, his only red flag is injuries, All, Yeah, and quite a lot of them. And that would fit with Miami. Trip. All the offensive Trip. line injuries. So that's the only big risk there. Miami didn't have a first-round pick last year, and I don't know if after two years, if you if your only first-round pick is a center, you know, if, if that feels great. Um, but just something to keep an eye on there in the first round. Um, the other part that they have to figure out, Christian Wilkins on the defensive side of the ball. As I've said a few times, there were five 2019 interior defensive linemen that went in the first round. Uh, Quinnen Williams, Ed Oliver, Jeffrey Simmons, Christian Wilkins, and... Who am I missing? Dexter Lawrence. The other four, not named Christian Wilkins, have all signed long-term deals. And I think they've signed the right long-term deals relative to their play. Right? Ed Oliver's got the worst deal out of those guys. I think he's played the worst out of those guys, even though he's been solid. Christian Wilkins deserves somewhere in between Ed Oliver and then those high-end guys of Dexter Lawrence and Jeffrey Simmons. And he remains unsigned. Is he going to get tagged? By Miami come back this year but he's the one guy that did not get that long-term deal and he's had a pretty good solid career as a run defender who can get after the quarterback a little bit yeah and I think they're going to end up having to franchise tag him um, and that's going to squeeze them even more I mean okay they have the ability to restructure a ton of money but the point is as soon as you have to apply the franchise tag that is a fixed sum for that amount guaranteed applied to your uh, salary cap. So the the projected amount for uh, defensive tackles is like twenty one million dollars. So if they have to franchise tag um, him immediately, that's another twenty one million getting squeezed on that salary cap that they have to free up from somewhere else if they're going to go make moves like signing offensive linemen. Okay. Other re- here's other reasons they're going to get squeezed. Um, guys that will, that are get heading into the last year of their deal or need to be re upped soon. Jalen Waddle. I know people are talking about trading Waddle before he ends up becoming expensive. Right. Um, Javon Holland in the secondary, and then Jalen Phillips at edge. Jalen Phillips is, you know, when he's healthy, has become one of the better young edge defenders in the league. Uh, all of those guys need to get locked up at some point. So Miami is—they're really in a crunch here, trying to maintain that balance of 
of uh, re-signing their own, but fitting them in to all of their. Remember their aggressive moves that I mentioned earlier. They they went and got Jalen Ramsey and Tyree Kill and Bradley Chubb. I mean, they've brought a lot of salary onto the team over the last couple of years. So there's going to be some some turnover somewhere over the next couple of years with some of those veterans if they want to keep their younger players. There will be, um, and I think there'll also be an absolute ton of restructures from some of the big contracts that they have, the big cap numbers they've got, guys like Tyreek Hill, Jalen Ramsey, like those key pieces that are definitely staying there are going to be restructuring, freeing up a lot of money. But, you know, they're not, they, they are in a squeeze. I mean, there's just no way around that. When the thing, teams that play the game like this, the salary cap game like this, Miami, New Orleans, et cetera, um, it's, it's, not that, it's, it's not that it's not foreseen or it's a surprise or it's salary cap hell. But it does mean you need to make some things happen that you wouldn't if you did it the other way around, right? Like the Saints every year go on this roster purge and clear out a bunch of players that they can't keep if they want to stay cap compliant. So Miami is going to have to get rid of some people and or make some deals that they probably wouldn't if they hadn't played the game this way. Okay, one last thing. I'm not trying to be all doom and gloom for Miami because I'm, I'm just looking into the future, and it's, it's going to be just really difficult keeping all these players together. I know they're going to they're gonna restructure to, like, right. to live this year, to play. I'm just talking about the future of the Dolphins. One of the things I like to do is, is to rever- reverse course and look back at how often teams drafted over the last couple of years. Dolphins this year have six draft picks, so below their allotted number, of course. They only had drafted four times in 2022, four times in 2023. Even with the lack of depth, perceived lack of depth in this year's draft on day three, at some point, to offset the fact that you can't pay everybody, you got to go. You got to draft more. You have to have more cost-controlled players on your roster. So I'm suggesting this offseason you you turn six into ten. No matter what the depth of the draft is, they need to draft more. When you have a three-year period where it's going to be, what, 14 draft picks over a three-year period, that comes back to bite. That comes back to bite in the NFL when you have that. Some teams draft 14 times in one year, right? So that's going to be one of the things I'm keeping an eye on with Miami. I want to see them get younger and attack with volume, more so than I say this for other teams because of what they've done the last couple years. They don't have a lot of draft value in what they in in the last couple of years but also this year i mean they've got six picks this season but four of them are on day three the time where we just said you don't want (laughs) this is the year you don't want day three draft picks so they've got a first rounder 21 overall they've got a second rounder 55 overall everything else is round five and onwards so i agree with you i think they should try and move like if they are an ideal candidate to trade out of the first round and say look it's great we have a first round pick on the other hand we desperately need more higher value draft capital so 20 pick number 21 is going to get turned into you know an extra second a third or whatever if they could turn 21 and 53 and go from two top they they only have two picks in the top 150 ish right if they could turn that into four in the top 100 yeah i think that's the way to go for future proofing of the roster but also for just potential immediate impact as well Um, But I think that's – you have to do that given um, the contract situation across this roster. Mm -hmm. Um, So do you have a take on Tua and what to do with him? I mean, you you need to – I think they have to pay him and try and get it done for as cheap a deal as they can. I mean, that's that's just the reality of it. You can't – I don't think you can look at what they've done and what Tua's done so far and say – we can just move on from this. This is easy. Like, I can get this out of anybody. Now, even knowing – the effect that that offense can have on other people. The point being, aside from anything else, the biggest fan of Tua is Mike McDaniel. So that alone means they're going to be keeping him. Mike McDaniel is not looking at this and saying, between the per- the evidence I have and the evidence of San Francisco and Brock Purdy, I can go and draft a guy in the seventh round or the fifth round, plug him in and make magic happen, and that's my new Tua for a fraction of the cost. Mike McDaniel is looking at this and saying, I had a guy that can light up the NFL, that can throw with better anticipation than anybody else, that can like be you know, one of the top one, two, three in yards per attempt, that can you know, put up all these crazy numbers. We need to get a deal done. And yeah, that deal might be less palatable for Tua than it is for Mahomes or Josh Allen or Joe Burrow, but you got to do it. You, can't, you don't really have a choice. I don't, I don't see a way you can say, no, nah, 
you're only worth 25 million a year to it because we know the other things are that important we're moving on one of the things i'm going to do to every uh, every mid round first uh, every team with a mid first round pick is give them brock bowers so let's add brock bowers to this mix if okay. he falls to uh to miami in so the first round i thought we're trading out of the first round yeah then I want to take Bowers too. You're right. We got it. Yeah, it's 21. Yeah, he probably won't fall that far. You're right. We're gonna trade down. Accumulate the picks, Miami, and franchise tag Christian Wilkins. I mean, they're being they're being very popularly mocked to a bunch of offensive linemen at 20. So the question really is, at 21, do you want somebody like Jackson Powers Johnson? Do you want a uh, Troy Fontenot, or do you want to trade out of the first round entirely and pick up extra picks? I would rather trade down. I think, that's I, think what they there's, I think there's some interior offensive line depth mm. to be had with a couple extra picks there. From the laminated model. From the laminated model. As of right, pre-combine. It's pre-combine. Oh. Combine's going to move things all over the place. Well, that's going to mess up the lamination. I'm going to... I have a laminator. I don't, I don't have to go to Staples for this. I do it at home. <laughs> I'm going to... We'll have a new one post-combine once the data's in. That's the worst flex anybody's ever had. Got my own... I don't need to go to Staples got for my this. own laminator. When everyone else was having a computer growing up, I had a typewriter. I was like a little behind. Hmm. But I was excited to have a typewriter for a while. Nice. Back in the early 90s. All right, Dolphins fixed? Yeah, I guess. I mean, look, we're giving suggestions. We're giving suggestions. Up next is the New England Patriots. <clears throat> a lot to suggest here. Gerard Mayo's coming in. Elliot Wolf now the de facto GM. Um, it's interesting from a structure standpoint, uh, you know, like they say, parents, you, you, uh, you take the best from your parents and you take their weaknesses and you try to, you know, right their wrongs, so to speak, in your parenting. Mm. Like, oh, my parents did this, this, and this. I'm never going to do that. I, I sense some of that with, in New England right now where Gerard Mayo is like, oh, we're going to have a big staff instead of a small staff. We're, gonna have, we're not going to have people doubling up on jobs. We're going to have very distinct roles. Just from a structure standpoint, New England is immediately – Moving on from the Bill Belichick method, which means are we looking at a more collaborative team building experience across the board here, um, just as a starting point? But Mayo is also. And is that a good thing? And is that a good thing? And the other thing that Mayo is doing is giving little nuggets of information when he speaks, which, you know, Belichick would never do. And so the couple nuggets that Mayo has given are basically, hey, uh, we've got money to spend. We want to spend it. So the. Uh, the credit card will be in use in Foxborough this year, and New England has uh, many holes to attend to here. Yeah, and many monies to use to, to fill those holes. So at least they have the the, the ability to spend and, and go and attack some of this. So, yeah, I, I think they're going to be – I mean, this is a team that was terrible last year. <laughs> they're going to need all the help they can get. They should be attacking both free agency and the draft. Um, the last time they spent a lot of money, Ooh. a couple off seasons ago, and I, I think I was, I was a little wrong at the time because I thought that the investment was going to come back to bite them. The investment itself didn't. They didn't have – they weren't necessarily cap-strapped. Right. But everybody that they paid for was, like, just okay. It just didn't work. Yeah. I and mean, that was the thing. It, it was Hunter Henry yeah. and Jonu Smith and Nelson Aguilar. And um, was that the year they got Judon? I think Judon was fine. Um, who's the guy in the secondary? from uh, Jalen Mills. I mean, those were all the guys that they were spending money on yeah. in that year, and it was just like you just <coughs> spent 10 to $15 million on a whole bunch of, yeah, okay. The big thing was the offense. Like, they went and made both tight ends the joint top paid, right, tight yeah. end in the NFL, and neither one of them has been a particularly important factor in the offense at all. I mean, Jonathan Smith was a disaster. Hunter Henry's been an okay tight end for a guy that at one point looked like he was going to become the next <coughs> great young tight end in the NFL. It just didn't happen. And then, obviously, the Mac Jones thing has been a complete disaster. So, it, you know, it was just it was the biggest spending spree they'd ever had, and it just didn't have the impact that it was supposed to. Um, so then the, the big question in New England is, okay, they're picking at three. Is that definitely a quarterback? Right. And we, we generally lean the side of, you know, take your shots at quarterback. But I do like to pose the question, do you want to build the infrastructure first? Do you want to build the roster first? And is New England at three – can they get an absolute haul yeah. because of the desper desperation of the Falcons potentially at eight, the Vikings at 11, is it the Broncos 12, Raiders 13? Because of the desperation of those teams, is it actually better at pick three to trade down, 
accumulate a bunch of picks because it's a it, this is a multi year rebuild for the Patriots. I mean, even if you can't trade down, is it better to simply is it better to simply draft Marvin Harrison Jr. Essentially, I would say if you if all positions were created equal, if you looked at a position agnostic big board, Marvin Harrison Jr. would be the consensus number one player in the draft. Yes. So I, your choices at the moment, if you're the Patriots, are assuming you can't find a trade down uh, partner, is do we force a quarterback because we need one at number three, knowing that at best it's going to be the third best quarterback in this draft or the third uh, quarterback selected in this draft, whether or not you have him ranked higher than that, um, or do we take what would be the consensus best player in this draft at number three and deal with quarterback later? Like, if the quarterback situation is as bad as it was this year, we're going to be picking high again next year, only now we have Marvin Harrison in addition. I think there's a case of that. Like, I, you, you need a quarterback, but I, I hate the idea of being forced to pick one when at best you're going to be selecting the third guy off the board. And then, So then do you just come back in the second round and maybe take a quarterback? So you're, you're hedging a little bit. You're yeah. taking your shots at quarterback which we, we always encourage. Take your shots at quarterback. The Patriots do pick at 34 in the second round. They've got seven picks this year. Nothing crazy either way. Do you pick your quarterback later in the draft? Do you get a Michael Penix on the turn? Um, because if they're going to spend money in free agency, are they the team that's going to go all in for a T. Higgins, say, at receiver? Because now you're painting this picture of, all right, we're going to go get T. Higgins or Mike Evans. I mean, I don't know if Evans really wants to go to New England that, I mean, that one doesn't make sense in terms of, I think, age syncing up with yeah. the rebuild project. I don't think it's the same as, you know, last year when I was advocating um, the, the Panthers grabbing DeAndre Hopkins, right, for a short term, like just make sure the rookie's good. <clears throat> right now we're, we're painting a picture where we don't really have a quarterback and we're trying to get infrastructure in place so that when we get one in a year's time, he steps into a ready-made situation. Mike Evans doesn't mesh with that, I don't think. So let's say – Let's say you can you can get a T. Higgins. You can convince him to come to New England with no quarterback. Right. That's a challenge, right? Getting sure. people the, in, in free agency, getting people to come to your city, it's easier when you have I mean, or you know, or they execute the trade for T. Higgins. You know, T. Higgins gets franchise tagged. Yeah, he gets tagged you right, flip right, right. the first round pick for him, sign him long term, that's easier. Well, then that's a challenge, right? Because we're ta- we're trying to we're trying to take number three and maybe draft Marvin Harrison Jr. Right. I mean, not the first, yeah, the not the first round pick, but like yeah, maybe you can get this, something. Yeah, from. but like, can you, is that the play? Because um, the other piece is you don't have any tackles either in New England, right? There are all these. It's it, it's a whack a mole type of roster. Like you need a starting tackle too. Do it. In, in a, if they if they drafted Joe Alt at three and just said, okay, we're just going to get the tackle. Let's yeah. just get that out of the way. And, we'll, and then we'll attack receiver later with the depth and everything. That would be the most unsexy number three overall pick for a team that needs a quarterback. But is that actually the best long-term move? Yeah. Because they've got all these foundational pieces that they need on the offensive side of the ball. I don't think it's crazy. I mean, that usually is where teams default. Like, when, when teams are in a situation at the top of the draft and they don't either they don't have a quarterback need or they don't like the quarterbacks there, you pick an edge rusher or you pick a tackle. So I, I absolutely think, look, Marvin Harrison would be the consensus best player on a board that didn't factor in quarterback value. And I don't think you can ever really go wrong by simply taking the best player that you think is in the draft. But if you drafted who you think is the best tackle and just locked down the most important position on your offensive line immediately for the future, I don't think that's a bad move either. Because um, I think, I think there's, fair, there's fair points about like if you drop – Jaden Daniels or Drake May, right? You pick that guy at three. And then it's like, okay, where are my two starting ta- two starting tackles, right? Trent Brown's a free agent, and he wanted out anyway. Michael and Wenu hits free agency. Maybe they could bring him back on the cheap, as we've mentioned before, as a former sixth-round pick. Maybe he's not as coveted. But you don't have that infrastructure in place for either of those, those rookie quarterbacks because it, it is, it's a multi-year rebuild. I mean, you can paint with the, with the third overall pick and at the top of the second round. Like, you can paint an incredible picture of, you know, if they get Joe Alt at three and then in the second round you end up with, like, a Troy Franklin from Oregon or somebody like that or an A.D. Mitchell from Texas. Like, someone like that ends up being available at the top of the second round. I mean, that's an insanely good duo to bring in in lieu of a quarterback. Or, you tra- or do you trade down with Atlanta and at eight you could still get a tackle 
plus all the extra yeah draft. I mean, capital. I think any if you're going to if you're going to eschew the quarterback in the draft, then any scenario of trading down is better than I think taking the guy. But yeah. You need a guy. You need somebody else to be enamored with the pick that you're not enamored in for that to make sense. Um, I think I'm I'm usually in the take the quarterback camp. I think I'm in the trade down and accumulate assets camp this year for New England, just where their roster is. The other interesting thing is on the defensive side of the ball. On paper, it doesn't look great, right? It's but we saw them play pretty well last year. How much of that is is Belichick, multiple Belichicks being right. involved there. Gerard Mayo is still there. But the defense has done a they weren't they haven't been great over the last four years. They've been solid, mm-hmm. right? And how much of that is actually the Belichick factor? And you lose that edge, right? There was an edge having Bill Belichick. And now you've lost multiple Belichicks. <laughs> you've lost multiple Belichicks. <laughs> but you've still got one, right? Didn't they have they still got one remaining? They have a the, third uh, Belichick still there, right? The lowest ranking Belichick Correct. remains. The, the, the lowest ranking Belichick is still there. Correct. So how much juice does he bring to the table? Right. So, I mean, have you... Yeah, when we do these team-building exercises the last couple of years, it's like, ah, oh, New England looks solid. Defense isn't great. you know. They, but they always you know, seem to work together, and they get the most... Like, Jabril Peppers still, you know, what they, they still find these gems later in their career and develop them and turn them into pretty good players. I think they hit on Christian Gonzalez as a, as a rookie corner last year. Christian Barmore broke out. But also, like, so much of the... You know, the young, talented players they bring in. Like last year, their draft was all characterized by, okay, they've got some raw, talented playmakers, and now they're going to be coached by the Belichicks, all three of them. Right. Uh, And that's a perfect environment for those guys to maximize what they can do. We saw a brief snippet of Christian Gonzalez looking amazing before he got hurt. Um, But they also, you know, had guys... um, Like Keon White, and you're like, he could be amazing with a a bit of Belichick coaching. Well, now that that's gone, unless you think the lowest ranking Belichick is capable of replacing all of that. Andrew Rod Mayo, Andrew Andrew Rod Mayo. But now it's like one of the things, one of the characteristics of Patriots teams might not exist anymore. This idea of they can take flawed or you know strange, unusual, raw body types or players and get the most out of them on defense. We have no idea anymore if that's a thing or if now they just have a like a collection of flawed players that nobody knows how to put together. Yeah, the point I, I think I made it at some point during the season, like if Jabril Peppers as a guy that was kind of an underachiever for most of his career and he went and had a great season last year for New England, if he did that in one of the Brady years, you'd be like, oh, look at Bill doing it right. again. He, you know, he really got the most out of this, you know, career retread type of player like Jabril Peppers. Like, I don't think Bill really lost his fastball when it comes to that aspect of things. It just doesn't matter if you don't have the quarterback. It doesn't matter. It doesn't actually move the needle. But when you have the quarterback, it, it does. Like, all those things add up, and that's what leads to championship caliber teams. So if you lose that edge... To the, plus, Kyle Duggar hits free agency. He's been a good, versatile player for them. Josh Uche has been a good, solid pass rusher for them. As much as the offense needs love and attention here, the defense might need some more talent there too. So, again, I, I'm looking at a multi-year rebuild, and as the Patriots GM for today, I am really tempted to give up the option of one of the top three quarterbacks. Um, I would take Drake May. I think I would take May over Daniels. I'm not there yet on Daniels as far as, like, he's right – there with May, I could be uh, swayed, but I think I'm trading down and just accumulating picks and, and saying this is a two year process, guys. Yeah, well, so that's the thing is uh, I'm interested in what the ownership um, behavioral dynamic would be after a bad year, right? So they're in this strange situation where they've basically, as an organization, thrown Bill Belichick under the bus and said, "You did this. This is your fault," right? Yeah, it all went its separate ways, but you forced Brady out of the building. Brady had success post you. You had no success. This is effectively your fault, and now it's time for you to no longer be here. And yeah, we'll dress it up, and we'll make it look nice on camera, and we'll get a hug out of it, and you know the PR will be great, but we've essentially determined that this is your fault. So, And we had this genius you know, succession plan in place. In writing, Gerard Mayo has been the, the heir apparent, the anointed one, for some time to come so on the one hand you're really motivated for that to work out right because otherwise you look really stupid you got rid of the greatest coach of all time you replaced him with somebody that you had handpicked and the whole thing was a mess so the crafts have to be incredibly invested in making that work out but how much patience do they have with that like if if they because on the one hand you would say well 
Gerard Mayo is going to have some time, right? Because they need it to work out. So he can say, look, I'm not going to pick the quarterback this year. We're going to get him next year. We're going to build the thing, you know, the infrastructure around him so that the new guy is able to come in and be good right away. On the other hand, if they win two games and the whole thing looks terrible, is the narrative going to be, you shouldn't have got rid of the greatest coach of all time? Uh. The, the billionaire dynamic here. If, you, if you've read some of uh, the Patriots, I don't know, the stuff that's come out in recent months, the idea that like Robert Kraft, I think, was nudging for Mac Jones. And he wanted, the narrative is that he wanted a first round quarterback that he could you know, embrace and have the relationship like he had with Tommy, you know, have the next guy. Right. And that was going to be Mac Jones for them. So if, if that's really what Robert Kraft wants as he's getting older here, you know, and he wants that quarterback. He wants Jaden Daniels or Drake May. Like, give me my first round quarterback that I that can be my guy. Then maybe you have to go QB, and you just you have to be really good elsewhere with all that money that they have. Maybe it isn't all about making the splash plays. Maybe it is about spreading it, spreading it around, filling the roster with starters, getting your starting tackles, um, getting the second tier of receivers. And just embracing that uh, Robert Kraft wants a first-round quarterback, so you better draft one. So let's let's park the draft thing for a second. Where are they spending this money in free agency? Because presumably they're going to be significant players. I mean, I would make a move. I'm 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 very worried about the second tier of receivers. Like Tyler Boyd feels like the guy that if you get him for like eight million, I don't know what his projection would be. Like I'm okay with Tyler Boyd. What do we have? Yeah, two years, eight eight point seven five. Like I'm okay with that as a piece. That's not getting you over the top, but that's a piece. You, you make a play for T. Higgins if, if he does hit the market for whatever reason. But beyond that, like you gotta, I think you got to take some shots at receiver, but it's not, it's not completely changing the game unless you add in a, a Marvin Harrison or you draft two. Um, and then I think you got to look at the offensive line because that whole offensive line was an issue. The problem is two out of the top three tackles are Patriots. Right? Trent Brown, who didn't want to be there, and Nwenu, wherever he ranks. Well, the problem is it's not a good free agent group for offensive players. <laughs> it's a very good free agent group for defensive players, depending on how many of them hit the market. Um, but I don't know. But their needs are the other way around. They need offensive uh, repar- re- repair work, and they don't need necessarily the defensive work. But I think if you were allocating where the money should go, you know, they should make a run on some of these defensive players and just say these are elite potential additions. Yeah. We'll figure it out elsewhere. Because like I said earlier, I don't think the personnel on defense is great. And, I, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on that right. generally. Like right. you could, I mean, again, it, it, there's always difficult. Like there's only one franchise tag to go around in Tampa Bay and multiple players need it. So if an Antoine Winfield Jr. hit the market, he's arguably the best safety in the NFL. I mean, that's any time you can allocate money to a guy that you can say is the best player in the league at his position, it's probably like not fit. bad expenditure. So, you know, Winfield, say, Jalen Johnson probably gets franchise tag. Legereus needs Legereus another case need. where there's only one franchise tag. Multiple players need it. Yeah. Chris Jones, if Legereus Need hits the market, he's a player that can do everything in that secondary. So I mean, Maybe that's part of the play is, is – Spend the money on defense, right. draft offense. And there's pass rushers in, in this free agency group as well. Like, you've got Matthew Judon. You know, you're losing a couple of guys, though, Josh Uche, et cetera. Like, you could go after a pretty high, high-ranking high pass rusher to bring in as well. And then maybe all the work for the <clears throat> offensive side just gets done in the draft, which is another reason to maybe delay a year for the quarterback. So my uh, solution, we're going to convince the Crafts to have some patience with us here. It's a multi-year rebuild. We're going to spend some money wisely and uh, draft on the offensive side of the ball because that's the strength. The strength of the draft is the opposite of the strength of potential free agency here. Yeah. I wonder, I mean, if you want to make that argument to the Crafts, um, you don't need to look any further than Carolina last year and Bryce Young. Like, look, if we don't have the infrastructure in place for this guy, it's going to go badly regardless of how good we think he is. Right. Um, I might make that argument if I see them at Sloan next week. The craft. They, uh, I think, uh, I think Jonathan is a, a panelist, as I am, a co-panelist on the same panel. No, not on the same oh. panel, but we we would potentially share the same green room, yeah. right? Like Robert came through the green room with his security detail last year for about thirty seconds. Mm-hmm. So if I could track him down, give him this, show him the model. This, and I, so I need I need the one pager that shows the success rate, mm. and I'll be hired on the spot. How does that? How do you how do you sell yourself to the to the billionaire? What, is he the billion? Is Robert? Yeah, Robert Jonathan. was there. 
What is Jonathan's that? on the panel. That's his son. I mean, he's right. Is he a billionaire? What is he? Because I mean, Robert's a billionaire. Heir to the billionaire. Heir to, but what does that get to you? The, Make, makes it, makes you Tony Khan a billionaire. a billionaire. You're just a millionaire, though. That's the situation, right? You have. You, you don't have get. You don't, I don't think you develop the mindset until. Oh, I see until what you're the, saying. Until the trust fund so kicks speaking in, speaking to and Robert and money. Jonathan, it's like a different conversation. Yeah. Okay. Well, you'll have to coach me up. Just like Robert's get, a sneakerhead, right? There's no way Jonathan is a sneakerhead. There's, there's a mindset change when you ah, get the billions. Okay. Either way, they probably like good football players. Sure. So I could I could sell them on that. Mm-hmm. All right. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last couple of years. We've been drinking AG1 every day here on the PFF NFL Podcast. No exceptions. It's just one scoop. Mix it with water. Once a day, every day. Makes me feel great. Ready to go. Ready to take on the day and execute here on the podcast with great focus. It's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre- and probiotics, and more. It's a powerfully healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. I like to drink AG1 first thing in the morning. Recommended for optimal nutrient absorption. Fill up my shaker with extra cold water. Add one scoop of AG1, shake it up, and I'm ready to go. If I'm running short on time, can't mix up my AG1 before heading out, you just grab a travel pack. Each, each has an individual serving of AG1, just easy to mix on the go, helping to ensure that I get my daily nutrients no matter what. So if there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. That's why we've partnered with them for so long here on the PFF NFL Podcast. If you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash PFF. That's drinkag1.com slash PFF. Go check it out right now. Moving slowly, as usual here. New York Jets. Let's fix the Jets. Yeah. As, a, as Jets GMs here, how much are we... There's, there's like there's got to be an all-in mentality here, right? For this year, we yeah, got I mean, we got to win for Aaron. Yeah, we got to win for Aaron. Well, we finally at least get Aaron. Like, let's you know, <laughs> theoretically, you have to, yes, you have to assume that this version of the Jets is already immediately a lot better because they get Aaron Rodgers back. They have a real quarterback, not Zach Wilson. Yes. So it should be better. The, the biggest... So the focus just becomes, all right, this is actually a good team. We were a borderline playoff team a year ago with no kind of quarterback situation. The only concern was, hey, that offensive line looked rough, even if Rodgers had been there. So the entire offseason focus is, let's fix the offensive line. Everything that we are doing this offseason centers around the offensive line and then also how many extra playmakers do we want to get, Aaron? Yeah, but I feel like that's... That's icing on the cake. Like, we need to fix the offensive line. We think with Garrett Wilson and anybody else, Rodgers will make it work. If we can add receiving weapons down the line or if they stumble into us or if there's good deals to be had, absolutely. But let's make sure the offensive line is good, and then we're good. Jets pick at 10, nine total draft picks, only two in the top 100. So they only, um, they're out their second-round pick to Green Bay for, the, for Aaron Rodgers. So you pick 10th and then 72nd. At 10, I think every mock draft has them with a tackle. Mm-hmm. The one caveat that I throw out there for Jets fans is that the, you know, the tackle position is not an easy one to just plug and play in year one. Uh, the Bucks did it a couple years ago with Tristan Wirfs. They went into the draft with a need and filled it with the best tackle in the draft, who yeah. happened to be the third one off the board. And yeah, that's a home run, right? That doesn't always happen, though. Sometimes tackles take a couple years. You got the Andrew Thomas example. You have others. So... Do you actually want to go into the draft and say, sure, if Joe Alt falls or uh, Olu Fashanu or uh, Fuaga from Oregon State, well, whoever's there, we're going to take them. We're going to plug them in. Um, it could be a left tackle or right tackle, but you know, we'll see how they maneuver the line. And that's what we're doing. We're drafting a tackle at 10. Or do you want to try to solve it ahead of time before getting into the draft? I mean, do you want to? No. Are you going to have to? Maybe. Um, one, so, I mean, we talked before with the Patriots. There's not a great group of tackles in the free agent group. It's not like you can just go out there and sign, you know, an elite tackle. Um, now, two options or two difference, two exceptions, rather, to that. Number one, Tyron Smith is free agent. Now, he's old and oft injured. But when he plays, he's still as good a left tackle as basically anybody in the NFL. And for a team like the Jets, who is probably looking short-term, 
Tyron Smith might be able to come in and give you immediate all-pro caliber play at the most important position in the offensive line. I, every year in free agency, I get suckered in. I don't care how injured you're going to be. I don't care how old you are. You've got a big name. I'm in. Yeah. Uh, number two, David Bakhtiari we talked about as being a potential cap casualty, you know, a potentially a guy that the Packers might want to... This is GM Aaron speaking now. Right. Might want to move on from, obviously, Bakhtiari and Aaron Rodgers, you know, have a connection there. It was talked about at various periods last season before Rodgers went down, when, you know, when the offensive line wasn't looking great and we were... Everybody was connecting, anybody that Rodgers had ever met to the Jets. Um, so maybe back to Yari, there's a trade to be worked out there uh, with the Packers. Um, those would be two ways of fixing it before you get to the draft. If neither of those things has happened, I think you have to draft the tackle at 10. This is, uh, if you're all in, you might as well go all in. Sure. Get, get, the, uh, get the older, potentially but, injured mean, left tackles yeah. because... Neither of those are like, it's not like you're mortgaging the future. It's just that neither of them is a long-term fix. No, you just you just run the risk of if you only get half a season of either guy. And isn't Bakhtiari potentially talking retirement at this point? Yeah, as but well? like you know, this is all contingent on the idea of Roger saying, "Hey, you want to go win a championship?" and him being like, "Yeah, cool, yeah, let's do it." Um, so I like both of those plays because it's a the payout is great, even if the risk is great as far as and neither and by injury. the way, neither one of them. I mean, like you're bringing them into to the the worst turf in the NFL to oft injured guys. With you know Bakhtiari with a chronic knee problem and Tyron Smith with everything he's been dealing with, yeah, we're all in. I'm not you know I'm not saying either of these are magic wands to wave and fix the problem, but the potential like each one of them I think is capable of all pro level play for as long as they're on the field. Wait till Jets fans clip whatever you said and make fun of you. Yeah, you dude, wait the ten seconds. You wait. Um, how about another potential option? We mentioned Josh Jones as a left tackle only who's had success there. Does it feel good if you brought in, say, Josh Jones and Jonah Williams? Josh Jones is a good call. So Josh Jones comes in to play left tackle. When do they fix that turf, by the way? For the, <clears throat> for the remember when they had the old artificial turf? Yeah, it was worse. Yes, there were. But they're, they're going to change it for grass because of the World Cup and whenever. Oh, that's a couple years. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were like um, zippers in the turf zippers. that would. Yeah, it was horrendous, <laughs> man. Um, so what if what if it was Josh Jones at left tackle? Josh Jones is a good call. He would he would be a capable starter immediately at left tackle. Because right now your right tackle options: Max Mitchell, who played a couple years ago, not great. Um, Elijah Vera Tucker coming back off injury. I think Vera Tucker can be a solid tackle. I think he, yeah. and he's a good versatile piece. He could be a better guard, solid tackle. But could you bring in Josh Jones at left tackle and even Jonah Williams at right tackle, who again isn't you know a leader or anything like that, but can be a solid starter? And then you get Vera Tucker back on the interior um you still have questions at center like the, the, the work's not done there necessarily but i wonder if that's a starting point and and the reason why i would do that is because at 10 i keep looking at roma dunze potentially available from washington is that the piece that you if you could get the offensive line creep, crept back toward average by the draft then you you grab the top playmaker then guys like brock bowers and roma dunze Pairing them with Garrett Wilson and what you have on the offensive side of the ball makes that a little bit more attractive for Aaron this next last year, next two years, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I would – I think the Jets have got the kind of money where you could bring in potentially Tyron Smith and Josh Jones and say, all right, Tyron's a starter, but if he lasts seven minutes on the MetLife turf, Josh, get yourself ready because you're going in. Like, I like that, that would really fix the left tackle position. I think, honestly, you could get that done. Let Josh Jones uh, cross-train, left tackle, right tackle. Maybe he's your starting right tackle. Vera Tucker kicks back into guard to add depth there. Right. I mean, $20 million a maneuver. year is a good number for a starting caliber tackle in the NFL. I think you could get both those guys done for less than $20 million next year. Um, if they do decide, I mean, the other option, they don't have that second-round pick, but if they do draft... In the first round, Fuaga, you know, plug and play, more of a right. He played right tackle at Oregon State, so it's probably easier for him to stay on the right side. If um, I don't think Alt ends up falling to 10, Fashanu, the league's a little mixed on him. Love him as a pass blocker. Love him as a pass blocker. Agreed. And um, I saw him trap bar deadlifting like 700 pounds. It's a big number. It is a big number. 700. It's even. <laughs> I thought I was pretty good. I, was, I got up to about 300 Three. when I was training. 
three with a trap bar. Yeah. It felt like a good number for really? me at the time. 300? Yeah. On a trap bar? But you're huge. So, yeah. Should I be doing more than that? I, I, I didn't know people should. did 700. I mean, I don't think you're doing 700, but I think you should be doing more than three. Do you realize how far I got to go? Yeah. But you're huge. I mean, Rick is benching three. It's a trap bar, man. I know. It's a deadlift. You're a huge human, though. I thought my 300 was pretty good. I felt pretty good. I mean, that's how I got up to, to 94 miles an hour. As my trap bar went up, my, my velocity it. went up. Okay, here we go. So, look, we're figure it out. We're gonna draft, or we're gonna we're gonna bring in Josh Jones and Tyron Smith. We're gonna lock down left tackle with that, right? Yeah. We're gonna be left with. I've just decided. I'm gonna fire up the PFF mock draft simulator. Let it run for the first nine picks. Who's available? And we're gonna decide based off that who to draft. Okay. Now, I was thinking we're gonna have a choice of receiver. Or Fuaga. The Bears sniped us at number nine for Fuaga. So really? He's gone. Right tackle's off the, off the table. Why did the Bears draft a right tackle for the second straight year? It's hard redo to know. The, redo the sim. So, Alt is gone. Fashnu is gone. Fashanu. I have to... That's how people are saying it, even though... You like Fashnu. Else, well, that, everybody else with that name says it Fashnu. And yet, him and other people don't. Anyway, I'm, I'm doing whatever. mock drafts. So. Alt is gone. Fashnu is gone. Fuaga is gone. But... Roma Dunze yes. is on the board. I want that. I want to do that. So there we go. In, in my mock draft, Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze are both off the board. So Fuaga is available. Brock Bowers is available. Yes. Would you get Bowers at 10? No. As a playmaker? Just because Dunze is here. Okay. I, would, I mean, I think we've done yeah, that. Yeah, i take a Dunze. We leave Vera Tucker at right tackle. We maybe try and find an interior starter somewhere and lower down a free agency or in fact in the the draft um we fix left tackle and we added roma dunze rogers has got something to work with i like it that's good so we're, we're basically forgetting about the defense yeah for the most part largely here. they do need starting safeties which to be fair is fairly well stacked yeah even even ignoring it completely add depth you know figure out your safety position you gotta you lose bryce huff almost almost right. certainly to free agency so um, you know, take your shots on pass rushers. You're going to lose a little bit of defensive line depth, but mm -hmm. they should be good on that. Some side of, of which, you know, you've you future proofed. You know, you've got Will McDonald. He didn't feature much as a rookie. Like if he takes a step forward year two, I mean, Will McDonald theoretically can step into the the void vacated by Bryce Huff and be that situational speed pass rusher. Can he do it as well as Bryce Huff? Unlikely, based off what Huff was doing. But the, like that's the kind of future proofing transition plan that it's supposed to work right if it doesn't work okay but but that's the plan right now so it's all about 2024 here for the jets put all the pieces in place anything else from a playmaker situation to consider i like those options that we just had right do what you can to tackle prior to the draft and then take the best tackler receiver i would love a receiver to pair with garrett wilson is there anything else we should be looking to do there because um, you know, like, Alan Lazard's going to catch 50, 50 slants or whatever from Aaron. Yeah, I mean, the tight end group in free agency is underwhelming, but there's a lot of guys that can contribute to a solid offense. Like, again, if you think Rodgers is going to be the guy, you know. I mean, Tyler Conklin and C.J. Azama might be fine. Yeah, sure. For I mean, him there. There are, exactly. There are players that can work already there. I, I feel like they're okay. Like, I, I wouldn't, again, if things, like, I, I wouldn't, uh, make the moves we've done stop me drafting uh, another receiver in the mid-rounds, right? Like, there's just because we drafted Roma Dunze, there's no reason you can't do what the Packers do and consistently double dip. So, if they came back in round four and drafted a receiver, cool. Um, Jordan Whitehead and Chuck Clark uh, and Ashton Davis are all free agents. Just to touch on safety quickly, there are starting caliber uh, safeties in free agency. Julian Blackman, I'm just looking at 60s, 70, like between 60 and 150 on our list. Julian Blackman, Jordan Fuller, Jordan Whitehead's one of those guys. CJ Gardner Johnson, Deshaun Elliott, Tayshawn Gibson has been this like late ad for multiple teams over the last couple of years. Darnell Savage is out there, Mike Edwards. I feel like there's plenty of starting caliber safety talent. Bring those guys in and, and fill your spots. Mm -hmm. By the way, the Jets I mean, are fixed. They. They probably didn't feature last year as much because the quarterback situation was so terrible. Um, and who knows how Rodgers will react to them. But they've got young receivers in guys like Jason Brownlee and Xavier Gibson. Right. Who theoretically could be big parts of this year's uh, yeah. offense. They showed flashes last year. Jets are fixed. We're on to the NFC East. Start with the Dallas Cowboys. The 
Dallas Cowboys. The team I have the fewest answers for. Ever. Ever. Good roster. Keep winning a bunch of games. Play better in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, they're, well, they're the, they're, they're the NFC equivalent of Buffalo, right? Just stay the course. Don't do anything crazy. <laughs> You're doing the right thing most of the time. You just choke when you get to the playoffs. And there's really no solution to that from a roster management standpoint. I, I, got, I mean, I, I was getting this question earlier today because when, you know, again, 31 teams lose. Yeah. So when 31 teams lose, everybody looks for, well, here, here's what went wrong. The, right. the culture's wrong. You're looking for all these excuses. And well, what you have to answer is, is it a fatal flaw? Is it a fatal and repeatable problem that is stopping you winning games at that point? Or is it simply 31 teams every year lose and you're going to be one of them? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the playoffs, I want to know why they, they looked so bad in that playoff game against Green Bay. Yeah, well, Dallas, so Dallas is the intriguing answer to that question because it is, I think it is both an actual tangible repeatable flaw that is hitting them like they are running into every single year but it's not a roster one right usually when you're answering that question it's like oh here's your problem right you don't have enough receivers or your secondary is too bad or you've no pass rush or whatever it is the offensive line stinks and once you hit the best teams in the playoffs that becomes a bigger problem and it's one you can't overcome right Dallas is, is not a roster problem. It is something that they're running into every single year, but it's psychological. It's yeah. that, like you simply have, have this mental block now that we haven't won in the playoffs for decades uh, the way we need to, and everybody knows it, and everybody in the building knows it, and the whole city knows it, and America's team, like the spotlight has shined on us, and we choke. I was, my answer when this came up earlier, I was like one of, one of Belichick's strengths is the ability to just sit there in his monotone voice and it's just another game and then he sounds the same in training camp as he does in the Super Bowl week. I mean that's like like that's the answer. You know, can you can you get the Cowboys to treat training camp the same as week 1, the same as week 10, the same as divisional round, the same as conference championship and Super Bowl? Can you do that? Cuz for whatever reason they were just like, guys, it's, it's the playoffs. Ah, we're going crazy. Let's go. You know, they just, you know, they actually looked nervous and off right. in the playoffs. But because that's the thing, the only change you could make is a coaching change, I think. And they didn't do that. Yeah. So at least, you know. The, the so I bring all that up because because people try to, like, implement that tactically. So, that, so the Derrick Henry thing comes up a lot with Dallas or even Saquon Barkley or whatever. Uh, we we got to run the ball more. we got to change our attitude. we got to change the way we win. I mean, this was the best Dallas offense they've had. Yeah. It was Dak's best season, and C.D. Lamb broke out. I mean, they were outstanding, and they had an inconsistent running game this year, and they still continue to put up a ton of points. But I do wonder if – there's elements of that. Is this another team that we give to, to Derrick Henry and you know find different ways to win and different people to rely upon come playoff time? You go know, Derrick Henry here. Tony yeah. Pollard's a free agent. I don't know if he's going to get tagged or anything. Tony Pollard, by the way, completely two completely different seasons. Forced eight missed tackles in the first half of the season, 37 in the second half of the season, coming off injury. He looked much better down the stretch, but still not enough that I think Dallas is like, sure, yeah, he's the guy that we want to be our bell cow. There's definitely people in that building that look at what happened and when we need to get the Zeke back. We need to get, like, that's what this whole thing stopped working as well when we lost prime Zeke, you know? And the end of Zeke's tenure wasn't great, and then Tony Pollard did, wasn't able to become Zeke. We need the new Zeke. And whether that's Derrick Henry or whether that's somebody else, like, there's definitely people that think that's the problem in that building. Now, whether they're right or not, I think it's a different matter. Um, but ultimately, I think the Dallas thing is is vaguely similar to the Buffalo conversation, which is just don't do anything crazy. You're, you're in a pretty good spot. You've yeah. got a really good team. Most of what you're dealing with is is very good. Just don't do anything nuts to ruin it. All right, so actual holes that need to be addressed here. Tyron Smith. Well, hang on. The, the first, the, the single biggest problem is we now we're facing down the Dak Prescott conversation again because he's got one year left in his deal. The last deal that he signed is now expired. It structured it in a weird way, and now you're on the hook for the next record-setting contract you're going to give Dak Prescott, which, again, he might not justify. We're, we're however many years advanced from the last time we had this conversation, it's come back again. But he probably justifies it. Yeah, and I think he justifies it in a way that 
like the structure is a bigger problem than than the structure the money. is yeah because all these quarterbacks want different things right we always mention Allen and Mahomes are you know with their team for life and they, they've got cap flexibility and Dak likes to hit he likes to get repaid every three years like his cap number is sixty million dollars. Yeah, so you've got to sign him. And that's and before you've you signed sign him. him and start right. And that's before that money you're giving him a deal that's worth sixty million a year. <laughs> I think you do it. You have to. I mean, you, there's no way out of it. Essentially, so you're stuck with having to re-sign Dak Prescott to a new market-setting contract that's going to put his cap number to the moon. So do that first. All right. Now what are you doing? We got two starters to replace on the offensive line. Do we bring Tyron Smith? Do we try to bring Tyron Smith back on the cheap? Cowboy for life. Probably. Center, Tyler Biotish, hits free agency. I see the chat saying the run game hasn't been the same since they lost Travis Frederick. Well, maybe, sure. Maybe Colonel's the truth. Frederick was amazing. Yeah. Um, Biotish has been solid, though, so you got to okay. replace the center. And remember, Terrence Steele coming back off injury last year was, was a problem. He was, he was a weak link on that offensive serious line. Serious issues. So After are, they are we, hit him. Yes. Yeah, are we relying on him bouncing back? Do we have a choice? Like, Do we just have to cross our fingers and hope in that regard? Uh, other question I have here, Mike Zimmer coming in to run the defense. Mm. And is the, are there certain ways that he wants to run it? Um, I know everybody keeps saying, well, don't put safeties at linebacker. Like that was more of a, that was more of a injury issue than a, you know, going a lot into the it. season yeah. choice. A lot of it was. Um, so certainly that they should be better at linebacker. Um, I wonder if, if like um, if Harrison Smith – is a cap casualty? Does he come back, get reunited with Mike Zimmer? Do you bring in some of those veterans to help uh, solidify this defense? Because they got J. Ron Curse also as a, as a free agent. I wonder if Harrison Smith is a potential addition here at just, some point. Just staying quiet so people can snip that out. <laughs> what? Just you talking about Harrison Smith getting cut. That'll be 10 seconds on Twitter. And I just, Vikings fans. I Look at these it. PFF idiots saying that Harrison Smith's going to get cut. Don't you know he just restructured to save all the cap money for the Vikings and they'll never do it. He's a Viking for life. There we go. Mm -hmm. There's my rebuttal to myself. Nice. Well done. Uh, one thing I'm going to say about Dallas is to draft the best players. Draft the best players. Draft best players. It's a available. radical strategy. When they go back and forth between seemingly drafting for need and drafting for the best, uh, the best players, they do much better when it's just like, hey, we don't need Micah Parsons. We already have four linebackers who are awesome. We don't need Micah Parsons, but we're going to draft him. We don't need C.D. Lamb. We already have two awesome receivers, but we're going to draft him. And then they go in and they're like, oh, we got to have this run-stopping nose tackle. Got to have it. We're going Mozzie Smith, second rounder. We're drafting him in the first. Doesn't matter. When they stay the course and draft the best players rather than just fill in needs, they're a better team overall, better drafting team overall. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I also think they – they tend to be quite a good drafting team just generally. I mean, they, they have they hit, have. They've done a nice job. And they've hit on quite a few of those picks where they've kind of reached for need as well. Like, they've, I think, they've just generally done a pretty good job drafting. So, and they need to keep doing that because they have a couple of spots that they're probably not going to be able to necessarily patch up. Maybe we get Tyron Smith back. Maybe we don't. If we don't, we're going to need an offensive lineman, whether it's a tackle or a guard. You know, Tyler Smith probably gives you that flexibility. I mean, that's one of the questions is if they don't have Tyron Smith, Tyler Smith kicks out to tackle. He could probably need a guard um, as opposed to a left tackle. You need the center. Like, you know, they, they're probably going to go into this draft with a position or two uh, between offense and defense that needs a starter. Draft-wise, the, 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 uh, the five first-round corners, you know, at 24, if one of those guys is available with Stephon Gilmore out, I would try to bring Gilmore back for another year if possible as well. I thought that the Gilmore Cooks moves last year were shrewd. I don't know if they were – I mean, they didn't have the benefit of, uh, you know, going to the conference championship or anything, but I thought that really solidified this team, having Gilmore and Co – especially Cooks by about midseason when he started to figure things out. I wouldn't mind keeping Gilmore back, but I think you just have to – you do have to try to fill the cornerback spot, um, slot corner. You've got Deron Bland there, so you've got two out of three starters. Fill a starter at corner – Grab a guard or a tackle in free agency and then get into the draft without any of those glaring holes. And in the draft, we finally, we finally solve the, the, the bulk problem in the middle of the defensive line. For some reason, we drafted Mozzie Smith and we made him lose 182 pounds and turned him into a, like a, an undersized three-tech. Uh, we're going to draft 
to Vondre Sweat from Texas. Keep him in the state. We're going to line up 400 pounds of girth in the middle and say, you are not running here anymore. Done. Well, Enough. And Mike Zimmer said, forget it. We're not doing it anymore. I want 400 pounds of monster in the middle. I like it. We are stopping people running. Can we get Sweat in the second? Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So no, now we have 56. Sweat. That's okay. Now we yeah. have Sweat and we make Mozzie Smith eat again and put the weight <laughs> back on. And now we have a new Williams wall, except it's Smith and Sweat. <laughs> I like it. Okay. Sweaty that, Smith. That's a good solution. Yeah. That's a good solution. Now nobody's running Cowboys. up the middle anymore. Um, and then I'm just, do you, what do you do at running back? Do you actually make a play for Henry? They don't go crazy in free agency. No, no. usually not. It's funny. Like, Jerry Jones has this sort of splashy, glitzy, Hollywood type of reputation, and yet he doesn't actually tend to do that a lot at all. He's, no. He's, he's, he's really quite measured when it comes he's to... quite measured and reasonable. sounds crazy when you hear him talk, but he doesn't do crazy things for most of the time. Yeah. Um, it's a little disappointing. Yeah. Like, the craziest thing he does is refuse to fire coaches that consistently fail. Like... You know, if anything, he's too loyal and not. That's crazy. what I mean. Yes, the, to coaches or Zeke or whoever. Yeah. Like yeah. his craziness is actually characterized by his refusal to do knee-jerk crazy things, not the other way around. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think look, the running back answer is always draft them in the mid rounds and take your favorite. I mean, there are going to be good running backs available in the middle of this draft. Grab one. Yeah. I mean, Estime is a guy I've been putting a lot of places. I think he would be really good within this offense. There's, I mean, there's plenty of like who. Because this running back group is so unusual and so – it's quite deep, but it's not top-heavy. There's no, you know, B. John Robinson in this class. Like, Blake Corum, I think, is the best running back in this draft. He could be a third-rounder. Corum would be a nice fit right. for Dallas. But you know Step what I mean? Like, if he – imagine, like, yeah. there, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that Blake Corum goes in the third round, and he could be the best back in the draft. Marshawn Lloyd is a big play threat. I'm a big Dylan Johnson fan from Washington. If you just want a good, dependable back who can I mean, Trey step Benson, up and pass pro. Trey Benson, I think, is a really good back. That guy's another mid-round pick from, from Florida State. He could be really good. He probably goes top 60. Yeah. But again, like second, third round is not you know crazy. Bucky Irving is a really good running back. I see back a lot of people game. hyping up Bucky. He's, a, he's an early blue. And then you have the question of Jonathan Brooks coming off his injury, but coming out. Another Texas So we're going to draft one of those guys. Yeah. So we're going to use one Pick of our seven favorite. picks there. Pick yeah. your favorite. If you can get him in the third round, awesome. If you have to spend the second on him, eh, depends who it is, but sure. And then, so that's it. Stay the course. Add some good players. Fill your free agent needs as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Bring Tyron Smith back. And draft a mid-round running back. Draft a mid-round running back. And hammer home this year. We are emphasizing every week consistency. Day one of training camp, it's like the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is like day one of the training camp. Don't get nervous during, during playoff time. Just don't get nervous. Just don't get nervous. Don't freak out. We don't need anybody freaking out just because it's the playoffs. Don't need it. That's the speech. Mm -hmm. That's it. Cowboys fixed? Sure. New York Giants are up next. Good luck. Mm -hmm. How do we fix the Giants? How do we fix the Giants? Well, what are we doing a quarterback? When do we get out of the Daniel Jones contract? <laughs> I mean, we can get out of it now. It's just not tremendously palatable to do so. If we're, so Giants are drafting at six. Yeah. They're one of 17 different teams rumored to be trading up. Yes. I actually forget. When I talk about teams trading up, I've forgotten about the Giants at six a few times. Mm -hmm. I, I always cite the Falcons at eight, Vikings, Broncos, Raiders at 11, 12, 13. They are the best positioned team to trade up in terms of they are. being closest. Call New England. Do you want to trade up to three, or do you want to go higher? I think I would take any of those top three. Because that's I, the thing. Like, if you're trading up, it's not like you I just I don't need... think the Bears or Commanders are trading out, right? The Bears are they're taking Caleb Williams. They're not trading out. I don't think the Commanders are going to trade out. They have <clears throat> the Washington franchise. Certainly not with the Giants, anyway. So. Certainly not with the Giants. But the Washington franchise has been the team that, like, they took Dwayne Haskins at 15, because they just have not been up in the top ten. The last time they picked at two, they took Chase Young, but they uh, what did they have? They had just drafted Haskins, and I remember at the time, people were bringing up, "Well, should you draft a Tua or a Justin Herbert and double up and everything?" It's like, "No, no, we just drafted a quarterback. You got to take take the generational edge." So they haven't had many of these opportunities where they've needed a quarterback and been in the top three. So here they are. Washington, I don't think is moving. I think New England's the most likely to move just because there's so much to do there. 
and as we, everything we talked about during their segment. Would I trade up to three for one of the top three for a May or a Jaden Daniels? Yeah. Man, I don't know. I mean, the same thing that makes me leery about simply staying at three and drafting the third quarterback off the board would terrify me about trading up to three to take the third quarterback off the board. Yeah, I'm just more desperate with the Giants. Do they have any non-draft? Well, okay, so yeah, do they, A, have, would they take the fourth quarterback off the board at six? Like, are you drafting J.J. McCarthy at six overall? I don't want to. <laughs> I do not want to. Okay, but if it, if it unfolds that way, would you? Probably not. Okay. No. And then the alternative is, do they have any veteran hope is there any veteran option whatsoever that you would be comfortable with? Bearing in mind that Daniel Jones is sitting there on a $40 million contract. I mean, I guess it's, what are we trying to solve here? I think you're trying to, like, uh, this year, can the Giants be competitive with Daniel Jones at quarterback? Yes, they can. They did it two years ago. They were competitive. Um, am I banking on that? Probably not. So, so you're trying to, do, you're trying to like solve both things, right? We're trying to be competitive this year with Daniel Jones as our likely starter, but we're also trying to take shots at the future. I don't mind taking a quarterback at 39, their, se- their second-round pick. Hmm. So if, if – I, I, I don't know, Bo Nix's draft stock seems like it's all over the place. I thought he'd be getting more top-10 hype. He actually may have gone the other way right. coming out of the Senior Bowl. But if Bo Nix or Michael Penix are there, like just boom, throw a dart, see what happens at 39, take best player at six, and, they and have build two, that roster. Two second-round picks. 39 and 47, yes. Yeah. So they've got um, four picks in the top 70. So I, one of those is a quarterback, and and you can also package those to to trade up. So why don't we sit at six? Well, then we need I'll take best line. player. Oh yeah, I'm taking the best tackle. Yeah, I'm taking Alt if he's there. I'm taking Fashanu. I'm taking Fuaga. Right. So then we're at that point we're actively pr- praying the quarterbacks fly off the board because we want we want our picks. Yeah, I mean if yeah if Alt like we want QB one two three then we want. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. at four, uh, and then we need we only need the Chargers to pass on an offensive tackle. Yeah, I think the Giants at six and the Titans at seven are excited for a Joe Alt fall. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, yeah. That's so like the Panay, Giants. That's Panay Sewell falling to seven. Right. right. If the Giants could come out of this with getting Joe Alt at number six, which is by the way what happened on the uh, the PFF mock draft sim that I ran. You just did it. Okay. So no, we, no, no, the first one when we did the. Oh, oh, I got you. That's how it panned out. Is the Giants ended up and with then Joe we Alt. just move on from Evan Neal. Get him yes. out of there. I mean, you certainly – you bench him. Like, if he develops on the bench, fine. But you're yeah. not – like, you can't start again after what we see saw. See if he can play guard. He's not a guard type of body or yeah. fit or whatever. But see if he can develop there. But yeah. Have him no longer as a on-paper starter and see if we can salvage anything from his rookie. Career. I would also – I would tell John Michael Schmitz to play better. Okay. As well. That Much like helpful. I would with um, Vaughn Miller. Just and then, play better. Make and, me look better. And then we still need interior offensive linemen. Oh, yeah. All of them. I mean, this is – that's the free agency aspect. Like yeah. You can go get – this is what they didn't do the last couple of years. Or they try. I, I think they just got the wrong players when they tried. Yeah, I mean, but they like added Damian some bodies. Lewis, I'm just listing guys. Like yeah. Ezra Cleveland, Damian Lewis, John Runyon, Jonah Jackson, John Simpson, Graham Glasgow. They're all, they're all upgrades. I mean – Sign a couple. Right. Yeah. They're, absolutely. You go shopping in, in – the mid-range of free agency and try and get starting caliber offensive linemen because you didn't have any last year. Mark Lewinsky's still there. Like, he's he's reasonable enough. He just, you know, you want him to be your fourth or fifth best offensive lineman, not your best or yeah. second best. I mean, Greg Van Roten played a 1,000 snaps last year, was pretty solid. He had a good season. Like, there's no reason he couldn't come in and immediately be a capable starter for you. So we're attacking the O-line in volume, both free agency plus in the draft. So then, yeah, we have we draft Joe Alt in the first round. With one of our second-round picks, we're taking a quarterback. Which one are we taking? Whoever's there. Whoever's there. <laughs> Is J.J. really going to go in the top 15? It sounds like it. I don't know, man. Look, Jim Harbaugh said he's the best player in the draft. Other people have said he's not. They didn't coach him. <laughs> they did not. They were not, they were not there every They day. weren't there. He saw every throw he, he made in person. And apparently that, that used to matter and then doesn't anymore. All right, so um, we still need... Here we go. I'm going to do another mock then. <laughs> okay, we can't have this happen because J.J. McCarthy is sitting there at 39. So that's might, not, that that's, could happen in real life. 
But, that, but people will get mad if we do that. People will, you will hear, there's no way Stop listening happens. to the media hype. Stop listening to the media hype. Uh, so Just tweet it out. McCarthy's there. Penix Jr. is there. Bonix isn't. He went to the, to, ooh, he went a couple of picks ahead of us. Uh, all right. So we give, him, we give him J.J. McCarthy. And we say, you don't know what's going to happen in the draft. We didn't think Will Levis would fall. We just took round. Joe Walt and J.J. McCarthy. Yeah, there the you go. chat brings up a good point. What about receiver? What about playmakers? What if Malik Neighbors is there? Uh, well, so we have drafted, we have drafted Joe Alt and we have drafted J.J. McCarthy, and now we're back on the clock at number forty-seven. And among the receivers available at this this spot, using the PFF mock draft sim, Jermaine Burton from Alabama, Xavier Worthy from Texas, and Jalen oh, Polk. Oh, Jalen Polk. Roman Wilson there? Uh, Ricky Pearsall is there. Devontae Walker is there. Tez. Uh, no, yeah. you're you, no. Wilson's already off the board by then? Yes. Can he, we in pull? fact, went off the board one pick ahead to Indianapolis. I have already drafted Jalen Paul because I don't care anything you say at this point. That is a haul for the New York Giants. Look at us. Fidget. Joe Alt. Fixing the Giants. J.J. McCarthy and Jalen Polk with pick number 6, 39, and 47, and we added offensive linemen in free agency. We have nailed it. Fixed. I like it. Giants are fixed. We still need help on the defensive side of the ball. Whatever. New system. Um, Adoree Jackson, Xavier McKinney, both free agents. So uh, can we try to bring Adoree back? I still like him, even though he's coming off a rough season. I think for other teams, he's going. I mentioned yesterday, he's the James Bradbury buy low this offseason. Maybe it's a better... Maybe it's better going somewhere else. But I think they need help in the secondary. Drafted Deontay Banks last year in the first round. But, yeah, other cornerback spots, we're going to need some help there as well. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of holes for the Giants. This is why they weren't really a playoff team a couple years ago. Yeah. Playoff caliber team. I know they made the playoffs, but they weren't a playoff caliber team. Um, If we're just trying to be good for this year at corner, Steven Nelson – yeah, potentially available there. Sean Murphy bunting like no, nobody. The Emmanuel Mosley dart throw, the Ronald Darby dart throw, just to kind of like stitch it together. But it's another place that needs an influx of talent. Kendall Fuller, top fifteen on our free agent list. I kind of wonder there they might also be shopping in you know some of the reclamation project uh, areas like Christian Fulton. What do you make of him as a as a second? Year as a second contract guy, having his he could be a good buy low. His rookie uh, like rookie Fulton. contract being pretty rough. Yeah, I like Christian Fulton as a buy low, but I would I would attack attack corner in volume. Yeah, if I'm the I think Giants. I think it's a solid uh, free agent group of corners actually. Yeah, so I, I think double up in free agency there. Um, pass rusher generally, Kayvon. T- like again, how much how much does just having a a new defensive system help? Kayvon Thibodeau, why did he have such a drop-off in year two? I know I don't know where the sack totals ended up, but I think if you just look at sack totals rookie year to year two, it all looks the same. But PFF grade tells a completely different story with Thibodeau. Yeah, he had a very weird year. Um, the the good pit the good bits were still good, and he had a ton of sacks. So a lot of people think he took a step forward. Um, I I just did not see the same type of impact that we saw from his rookie season, and I didn't really see a good reason why. A lot of cleanup sacks and a lot of Sam Howell sacks, right? A lot of Sam Howell sacks. I mean, this is that's another reason why the sack thing is overrated for def- defensive players. If we say that the quarterback controls their sack rate, then playing against quarterbacks who are bad at controlling their sack rate is better for the defense, right? So Sam Howell is a big what did he sack him like five times right so but he was worse against the run as well like he he just didn't have a good year yeah. um and there were still some flashes of good but you know didn't take the consistent step forward that you would have expected um so the I, my challenge with the giants is i do think they need they need re- they need receivers tackles edge rushers and corners hmm. all of the highest value non and a quarterback right all of the highest value positions or of need and you can't you can't do all of it so there's got to be you know what some something's going to happen they're going to get a premium player in the draft at tackle receiver whatever it might be everything else has to be bargain basement type of shopping right um i wonder if jonathan grenard another guy that we've given to a lot of people is he a good opposite cave on thibodeau type of pass rusher uh Zedarius smith uh those types of guys in free agency might be needed do they go impact high impact to daniel hunter Oof. 
opposite Thibodeau. That would get, I mean, it's doable, but that's a lot of money. It is. Where's their cap? Middle of the pack? Yeah, right in the middle. I mean, I just know after that, after that first three draft picks, I'm doing the, you know, the, the Dan Campbell um, celebrations in the draft room. Like, I'm good. I'm happy. Anything, I don't care what happens after that. We're happy. All right. We gave the Giants some options. But um, honestly, it's a year. They, 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 they think they have a couple of years to get back on track. Yeah. And people are complaining. Like Jalen Polk, the Giants receivers are all small. Polk's not a small receiver. I mean, he's not a giant, but he's 6'2", 200 plus. Like he's a yeah, solid he's a good size receiver. All right, we good? Yeah. Giants fixed. Let's go Philadelphia Eagles. Philly. It's another one. So people are, again, people are trying to explain away what happened. Ooh, there are some weird reports at the moment. Dom. <laughs> now, I could buy Dom being the reason why things fell apart for the Eagles. But I the, still think that was a bad miscarriage of injustice. I agree. I feel like, I, aside from anything else, I feel like what happened was wildly mischaracterized because of slow-mo replay. If you watched what happened, I don't have any real problem with what he did. The guy stood up, got in his face. He just sort of backed him. He just split him up and went back up, guys. And that was it. And then, you know, whatever it was, Dre Greenlaw stuck his hand in his face. And, like, eh, and now it's like, oh, we got to ban Dom for life. What? It's not like he, I, you know, body slammed Dom, him out of the way or anything. I saw Dom down at the Senior Bowl. Stood next to him. Yeah. He's an impact player. He has an impact. He's an aura. Aura yes. guy. Yes. So the most recent report is that Nick Sirianni, his temper is just so out there and outlandish that Dom is his calming influence. Yes. So once the calming influence of Dom was, was not was there to reel Sirianni right. back in, all hell broke loose on the Eagles' sideline and in the locker room. Yeah. <laughs> once Dom was physically removed from Sirianni's presence, Sirianni was unable to control himself in any way, shape, it's or It's a form. loose cannon. Right. Which left the entire Eagles organization to spiral to out of the league, essentially. So to fix the Eagles... We start by getting Dom back on the sideline. Which he is, right? It was just a... No, it was a permanent... Haven't they banned all those guys now? Like, you're not allowed... I Give him a different role. He's, okay. Change his role. Isn't he a part, like, D-line D coach? I mean, we, just, we, might need to, we might need to change his job title to get him back out there. He could be the get-back coach. I don't care. But he's something. <laughs> We've got to get him back on the sideline. We've got to get Dom saying. back on the sideline. Okay. Yeah. All right. What else for Philadelphia? Well, yeah. We probably need more than that. It's, it's um, secondary. I mean... <clears throat> For all of the uh, all of the credit that we gave the Eagles in 2022 for the way they built that team, the way that they they stole James Bradbury off the um, Giants. I was going to say waiver the, wire, the trash heap, the waiver yeah. wire. You know, stole him for pennies on the dollar. But heading into 23, doubled down by paying him a lot of money. That came back to bite. Bradbury looked cooked at the end of last season. The whole defense really looked cooked. The middle of the defense was horrendous. Yeah. Every, nobody was on the same page. But it does feel like the back seven as a whole needs work. Yeah. I mean, the Bradbury thing, they went from one end of the spectrum to the other. They had a, an elite player paying or playing for not much money the year before. And then they somehow found a way of bringing both him and Slay back in, a, in an offseason where everybody thought at least one of them would be leaving, if not both. Uh, and they ended up with a guy playing badly for a lot of money, which is, you know, the exact opposite impact of what he had the year before. So do you just put that down to the variance of cornerback play in the NFL, particularly when you're not getting the pressure that you are typically accustomed to, particularly when your linebackers are all injured and you're paying, playing guys that are off the street, so their job is being, more, uh, being made more difficult? Um, or do you say that was indicative of a guy that's on his way out, you know, even though he's only 30 years old or whatever, and we need a complete overhaul. We need to get younger. We need to get better. 30, he's, that's ancient at corner. Yeah, but like he's you know, 30. he's a year removed from that like Pro Bowl type of season, right up until the Super Bowl hold. You know? Yeah, I think that the challenging thing about the Eagles is, you know, we talk to a lot of people around the league, and without getting too specific, because I can't. I mean, there's just a lot of there was inner turmoil in the building, right? And I don't know how much was 
within the coaching staff. Remember, they they were like eleven and three or whatever. And they're yeah. firing Sean Desai. They're firing. They're bring, putting Matt Patricia in there to call a defense that's not his defense, and like everything was just odd. And there's all sorts of rumors swirling about why and where the power struggle is and between whom and what have you. So solve that first, right? I mean, this is, this is a team that was plays away from winning a Super Bowl in 2022. Right. And the idea that Nick Sirianni was actually talked about as being on the hot seat, which from the outside looking in, to me, seems crazy. I don't care how bad they collapsed last year. They were plays away from winning a Super Bowl in 2022. And I think Sirianni's clearly a big part of that. So, like, figure out that piece of it first and get everybody on the same page. And yeah. then we'll start solving some of the personnel questions. But I think the fact that it, I mean, on the one hand, it's crazy because they almost won a Super Bowl. On the other hand, it actually makes total sense because every indication of the tail end of last season screams this is like a coaching collapse. Like this is, this thing is, is in a death spiral and the only guy capable of pulling it out of the tailspin isn't at the moment. And every move, in fact, that he's making to try and stop it seems to be making it worse. Like Patricia coming in and taking over the defense. Now, okay, that was last season. They didn't change him. I think on the balance of things, that's probably the right decision. So let's see what happens this year. Number one, everybody that was part of the problem on the defensive side is no longer there, and Vic Fangio's in the building. That should be huge. Um, like getting a guy like Fangio, who A, is still the best proponent of a defense that's still one of the most uh, impactful schemes in the league, even if maybe it's going out of vogue a little bit at the moment. He's still the godfather of that system. He's still the best uh, version of it. They still have a lot of talent on defense. And like I don't think I, – I think the reasons for him wanting out of Miami and him wanting into Philadelphia are legitimate sort of personal – You know, they're not like power struggle reasons. And so Bradbury and Slay could be a good fit for him anyway, yep. right? So just rolling it back with those. I mean, they're both they both have a couple of years left on decent sized contracts. So rolling back with those guys, uh, the pass rush too. It's another one of those on paper. It still looks pretty good, but the Eagles have always always kept up with it, right? So even though yeah they drafted Jalen Carter last year and he looked good, even though he tailed off a little bit at the end of the season. But you still have, you know, Fletcher Cox technically a free agent. Do you get what you steal one more year out Wait. of Fletcher Cox, Brandon Graham? Like they still have to replace, you know, part of their defensive line rotation. I mean, on paper, you were losing a lot of the heart and soul of that defense of or the defense yeah. in terms of Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham. Like they both those guys have been on the way out for a while. Um, they kind of, you know, they brought back Fletcher Cox last season for a deal that uh, on the field didn't really look justified, but in terms of mentorship and that kind of thing, it made some sense. Do you keep either of them around? I mean, Brandon Graham still played reasonably well last year, albeit in a, a much diminished role. I would not hate bringing him back at all if he's willing to do it. Um, but at some point, all these young players that you drafted, like the Georgia defense from a couple of years ago, actually needs to start playing like the Georgia defense from a couple of years ago. Otherwise, none of it matters. I think it's another team, though, that's it's, it's stay the course. It's similar to what we said about the Cowboys and the Bills. Stay the course. I mean, if when we go back and we're like, what happened to the Eagles who had the best record in the league? More it was than not a personnel. I mean, other than injuries on defense, it was not really a personnel issue. No, we knew there was, a, there was a coaching change on the defensive side of the ball. Um, so their two coordinators got head coaching jobs after right. the Super Bowl run. The, uh, the defense had a coordinator change when they were 11-3, and three, whatever it was. And offensively, the whole time we're like, man, this just doesn't feel right, and they're not handling the blitz, and Brian Johnson's off offense is just not – just doesn't have the same type of answers and explosiveness that Shane Sykin's offense had the previous year. So Kellen Moore on offense now, Vic Fangio on defense. I think that at least moves them in the right direction. Yeah, and let's remember, Jalen Hurts was playing hurt all year. Like, yes. all the way through that season, he was injured and getting it – you know, getting through it and – the word lethargic kept coming to mind every when I was watching. Like he just felt like he was just getting by. Yeah. The offense felt lethargic. There was no rhythm. All of it. So I mean, say what you want about Kellen Moore. I don't think he's been an elite coordinator. I don't think he's been bad, but it should be better than I think it was last year because they still have those pieces. We saw on the positive side. We saw Devonte Smith these last couple of years become a great complement to AJ Brown. 
Um, as a one-two punch, they're they're right up there among the best in the league. Dallas Goddard as a one-two-three punch from a uh, you know receiver standpoint with Goddard at tight end. That's a good starting point. They'll have another good offensive line. Once again, they had to figure out right guard last year. Kerem Jurgens was fine, especially when he's surrounded by the rest of those, the talent. They got to figure out center, assuming right. Jason Tires. Kelsey is going to officially retire. Did he officially retire? Or he just it's not official, I don't think, but it's looking that way. So we're expecting Kelsey to retire. So that, does Jurgens move to center, and it becomes a you know a guard question? They. The Eagles you use the word future proof a lot. I mean, the Eagles have always been one year ahead. Yeah. As far as drafting and anticipating those things, so they they do a nice job of building that depth. Yeah, I mean, they've got they've they've done a solid job of of uh, at least projecting a succession plan in various spots. Now the problem is that doesn't always work, right? Like Nicobe Dean was supposed to be the succession plan at inside linebacker last year, and he was hurt almost all year. And they had to bring a bunch of guys off the street and try and make that work instead, like Shaquille Leonard, Zach Cunningham, et cetera, and linebacker was a problem for them all the way through the season. Now, does Kobe Dean, A, stay healthy this year, and B, if he does, does he play well? That's a big question mark. I don't think that they know the answer to that yet. Right, um, let's predict. They're going to take Kamari Lassiter. we got to get all the Georgia guys. But look, I mean, all, almost... Amarius Mims one, in the first round. The only one of those Georgia defensive players that has so far justified even the pick um, has been Jalen Carter and even he tailed off pretty badly in the second half of the season so yeah. that group as a collective Jalen Carter Jordan Davis Nolan Smith and Kobe Dean I mean Keely Ringo if he ends up becoming a starter like that group needs to justify shopping in the Georgia defense otherwise they've got real problems because they basically like half the defense was taken from that team. As far as draft picks at 22, we know the Eagles like to – they like offensive and defensive line. That's where they like to go. Um, is this a year, though, that, that they try to get younger at corner? Again, I, I, my, my annual battle with Eagles fans when I try to put a corner in the, in the first-round mock draft, or I tried to give them Brian Branch last year, and they almost ripped my head off. Maybe that would have been good. Uh, before we knew Jalen Carter would fall. Hmm. But would they actually grab a player in the secondary or a corner, the Quinion Mitchells of the world, if Terry and Arnold is there? I think Arnold's probably going higher. But uh, Kool Aid, if he's there, do they go corner? I mean, I don't think I don't know that we've seen enough from Eli Ricks or Keely Ringo to be like, oh, of course they're the future once Bradbury and Slay are gone. So, it could be a year to go that route. Um, if they're thinking about Lane Johnson potentially retiring in the next couple of years, do they go with an Amarius Mibbs again from Georgia? as a tackle there because they like to remember they grabbed Andre Dillard a year early before they were going to replace Jason Peters so tackle and edge defensive line generally could be in play again I'm just curious if they do actually go to the cornerback room you know who the last first round corner that the Eagles drafted was who Lito Shepard Lito yeah there was somebody from that era I was going to that era what was that 01 Oh, two. Oh, two. They, that was the year where they did the Green Bay thing. They double dipped and they got Lito Shepard in the first round and Sheldon Brown in the second round, and that was their like cornerback duo for a while. Yeah. So don't don't attack me. They Eagles actually went one two suggesting three. Suggesting so Howie would never draft a corner in the first round, but maybe he should. They actually went DB one two three picks that year. Two second rounders and a first rounder. Michael Lewis was the other one. Michael safety. Wow. And they went to the NFC Championship the next year or two i mean that draft that went leto shepherd michael lewis shelton brown brian westbrook as their first four picks in the first three rounds that's not bad oh solid if they do westbrook, that again westbrook they'll be in good, good shape this year and then uh yeah they went to the super bowl in 04 that would set the foundation for a super bowl run yeah in 04 what do they have four nfc championships in a row one super bowl i think it was anything else for the eagles here have we fixed the eagles uh, I mean, yeah, they, they need a lot of defensive tell play, depth. Georgia players tell them to play better. Georgia players got to play better. They need, I think, some defensive depth. I don't – like, they should – they've always been good on the defensive line because they keep trying to get as many bodies there that are playing well as, as possible. So if they're losing Fletcher Cox and or Brandon Graham, even if the Georgia guys take a step forward, they need to start backfilling that. They need to start replacing some of those guys. So second, you know um, – They've got two second-round picks. They've got a third-round pick. If they're spending one of those on defensive line, that's not a bad spot. I agree. So defensive line depth. I also think with uh, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith as the one-two, all of the other 
depth receivers, including Julio Jones, are all free agents. I think the Eagles could use one of those deep threats. Um, so all of the speed receivers, the Lad McConkeys and the Ricky Pearsalls of the world that we mentioned for a lot of different teams, I'm not saying get them super high, but if those guys are around in the third, maybe. I don't know where they're going to end up landing, but those speed receivers, man, I think they could use as a nice complement to Devontae and A.J. Brown. Um, so I'd grab one of those guys. And then the question is, what is the random throwaway, low-cost move that they're going to do to solve the running back spot? Ah, good question. So DeAndre Swift they got for $2 million last year. That's a good pickup. Mm. Played well um, overall. Gainwell, Kenneth Gainwell still there. Boston Scott, officially a free agent. Do you bring back Rashad Penny for $1.3 million again? Man. What did he have? Did he have any snaps? Almost like not. 10? Yeah. Uh, there'll be a low-cost running back move. There will be. How's that? Um, I mean, I, don't, I think this is probably higher cost than they're willing to go. I kind of wonder if Austin Eckler is going to be an absolute steal for somebody this offseason as a pickup. Yeah. He, remember he represented when he first signed the deal that he then got pissed off that the deal was not a fair you know, <laughs> compensation for his performance. But it's like, okay, I wouldn't ever give a running back a second contract above what Austin Eckler got. Like, I think that was, a re- that was like the, he- the high watermark of what I would be willing to go to for, running, for a veteran running back. Otherwise, I would just go draft, just keep getting young guys in the draft and keep getting low price free agents. So Eckler signed that deal wildly outperformed it, um, was looking for more money, didn't get it, got hurt, came back, didn't look like the same guy again, and will now be hitting free agency, you know, at basically 28, 29 years old, coming off a bad year where everything is sort of looking negative from a, from a team perspective. But I kind of wonder if that's actually going to lead to him getting underpaid again and proving to be a steal again. Like maybe a team that's willing to go to a kind of mid-price deal for Eckler actually ends up getting one of the best running backs in the league who's an incredible receiving option. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're onto something there. I, um, the teams that run the ball a lot and have the running quarterback, I'm more likely to pair them with decent running backs. Like, is it, Are they another team that takes a shot on J.K. Dobbins the same way they did the Rashad Penny thing? Do you get him cheap and just hope he is healthy and becomes explosive again with everything that Baltimore wanted him to become? Um, but yeah, I think they'll... Derrick Henry if, is is it's not in the Eagles' nature to right. to make any kind of big impact move. Is there any chance that that would change? And you say we've got Jalen Hurts, we have Derrick Henry for the same reason why we've paired Henry with say the Ravens. Here's a different way to win. We run the ball a lot and effectively. We would use him well. Is there any reason for the Eagles to go against the grain, or go against what their their normal tendency, and actually go after a Derrick Henry? I doubt it. Okay. Just had to pose it. Eagles fixed. Stay the course. Get Dom back out there. Add your depth. Get the new coordinators going. Keep Mm -hmm. trucking along. All right. Making terrible time. Let's wrap it up. Washington Commanders. What did I say? Steve loves former stars who are injured and old. I do. Every year. Mm. I really do. That feels like a flaw as it, for your GM prospect. I think it's a, it's a calculated upside play. Right? I know there's downside, but I'm playing for the upside. Yeah, but in the same way that, you know, the, the, like people that bet on horse racing and always go for the long shot because when it pays off, you're going to win big, but it, it never yeah, Because it off. offsets a lot of losses along the way. Yeah, but, one it, but it doesn't pay off because they're long shots for a reason. Washington Commanders. How are we fixing the commander, Sam? Well, we got the most camp space in the NFL, and we got the second overall pick, so it feels like we got options. Have you been? Have you uh, gone deep dive on the quarterbacks yet? Do you have a? Do you have takes on a top three? No, I need to get back into that again. I had the COVID thing blasted me for a week, um, and I'd kind of only skirted over the the surface level stuff to begin with. So I need to get back in. My only real take at the moment is that Caleb Williams is clearly number one quarterback and everything else is yeah tbd um i'm seeing a lot of people back and forth on Jaden daniels and drake may people that i like people that i trust i have a lot of ways on it i've gotten a lot <clears throat> lower on drake may i so i've i've watched a lot of caleb williams watched a lot of drake may and then i need to watch more of everybody else but 
when I watch more of Caleb Williams, I was sort of more impressed the more I watched. And when I watched more of Drake May, I was less impressed the more I watched. So I'm absolutely open to conversations that involve maybe Drake May isn't even QB2. Um, and that opens up guys like Jaden Daniels and even J.J. McCarthy, who we snagged for the Giants in the second round, or Bo Nix or whatever. But I don't know. I'm not blown away by Drake May is my point, which is relevant because Washington is probably looking at a scenario where he's right there. All right, for me, I'm gonna like, as of right now, I'm I'm with May as uh, as QB two. I would take him at two if I'm Washington. Are we even considering other options? Are we considering other uh, trade down? Are we considering not taking a quarterback? I, I well, at two, I think you probably have to take the quarterback. Um, the problem becomes what happens if you're like, let's say, just for the sake of argument, the the person making the call in Washington's building is exactly like me. And he's like, I really don't love Drake May. And he's the consensus, quote unquote, number two guy. Do I try and force somebody else who I probably don't love either? Jaden Daniels, JJ McCarthy at number two. Or can I find a trade? Like, is there someone else that wants number two enough that I can trade back and make it happen? And then you're in that world where, well, if I didn't love anybody here, do I love them more in the second round, even though I picked up some draft picks along the way? Like, it's probably, it's probably still not answering the problem, right? Sometimes you try to connect the dots based off of where a guy's been and what they've done in the past. So Adam Peters, the new GM for Washington, was in San Francisco. He was there with Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch from the beginning. And I remember back in 2017 when, when Kyle and Lynch both signed massive contracts, six-year contracts, I said, okay, they don't, you don't need to force the quarterback. Go back to the Patriots discussion that we had. You don't necessarily need to have a quarterback year one build the infrastructure first. That's what the Niners did. Now, in hindsight, they passed up on, of course, they passed up on Mahomes and Deshaun Watson in those drafts. They passed up on Mitchell Trubisky. Um, they drafted Solomon Thomas, right? Those were, it did not turn out to be a good decision, obviously, knowing what we know now. But the point is they were, they were patient. And eventually the Niners started winning with the Jimmy Garoppolo's and Brock Purdy's of the world with a really, really good roster around them. That doesn't mean just because Adam Peters was in San Francisco that he's going to try to do the same exact thing. But I, is that an option for Washington? Because they have these free agent assets. They've got uh, nine draft picks, four in the top 67, including the number two pick, do you turn that into just a really massive haul and build an incredible roster and figure out quarterback later? I guess part of the question is, like, I wonder if the entire league actually is, is going to look at these quarterbacks the same way and say, I don't know that this is as strong a class at the top as people thought it was right away. And actually it's really Caleb Williams and then a gap to other people. And if that's how most people see it, I don't know what kind of market number two or number three overall is going to have. Like, sure, there are teams that want a quarterback, but if they don't love the ones available, are they going to do a crazy trade just because they need a quarterback? Or are they willing to be more patient in that and just hope that they find an answer? I think there's potential desperation there. I mean, but then there's also the case of, look, Drake May has – the tools are there. Like, the tools are there for Drake May to be amazing at the next level. He's got – prototypical arm size athleticism i think that's why he goes at two right yeah so not only does he probably go at two but there are probably going to be people out there that love that guy and i still think i said this ages ago i still think it's probably true i think there's probably people that will have him as qb1 like i don't love caleb williams i I love drake may so it's all in the eye of the beholder but i think at the end of the day we're looking at uh, people people think there'll be a top three even if there's a gap if they think there's a gap between caleb williams and two and three they're going to say there's a top three, and if there's a gap, it's between three and four. I think that's where we'll end up landing, that Jaden Daniels will end up going in that top three or four picks, that Drake May will. I would take May if I'm Washington. What else are we going to do with this roster? Remember, they got rid of this nice, really young defensive line that they had, traded away Montez Sweat, traded away Chase Young. Mm. There's When you look at the depth chart and returning starters, defensive side of the ball, there's nobody six. It's one of the lowest in the NFL. Yeah. Um, some pieces on the offensive side of the ball, but, yeah, still a lot of work to do both sides. Yeah, I mean, they basically they, they completely undid everything that they had on defense. You've got uh, Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne on the interior. You've got basically no edge rushers, edge rushers to speak of. Um, the secondary is now incredibly young uh, and not – 
proven at all. I mean, Emmanuel Forbes had a pretty rough rookie season. They need him to take a massive step forward in year two. Uh, yeah, they've got major problems on defense. Um, and on the offensive line. Right, they've got issues on both sides of the ball here. So um, let's take the quarterback at two, whoever your favorite is. And then from there, you mentioned all the cap space that they have. What, where, do we gonna, where are we going to go in free agency? Are they going to? Well, the good news is they are the opposite of the Patriots, right? Where their biggest weakness is defense, and that's where the strength of the free agent group is. So it includes I think, some of their free agents, Cameron Curl sure. being out there. But I think they can go shopping in free agency and actually bring in some players that have to legitimately transform the defense. Uh, Dan Quinn takes over as mm -hmm. head coach. I think in the in the past, Quinn was like the old school Seattle cover three coach. I think he's shown that he can adjust to his defense and what he's capable of doing. Um, he had a plethora of pass rushers in Dallas. Yeah, he has none of that in Washington. Certainly edge rushers. I mean, yeah, it's Jonathan Allen up front. Yeah, on the interior defensive line. So, so you've got to imagine he would want a top tier edge rusher. So they in the Daniel Hunter. Sweepstakes, Brian Burns, Bryce Huff, bring Chase Young back. Resign him. Um, I mean, Bryce, Bryce Huff, I think, would be an amazing addition to that defensive line. I don't, like, with the amount of money they've got, they could do two. They could get, they could double dip. They traded yeah. away their two. Let's bring in two new free agents, Bryce Huff and whether it's Janelle Hunter, you know, whether it's um, – Somebody else. I don't know if Brian Burns going to hit the market, but whether it's somebody like that, if they could come out of this free agent group with two starters, even if they're high price ones, I think that would be good. Because you're talking Peters in San Francisco and Dan Quinn. I mean, defensive line depth is yeah is in their history in the in in, in San Francisco in Dallas Quinn with Seattle wherever they've been. I mean, they kind of need to do the, their version of what the Browns did last year and just hammer a position group in in, in one off season. Um, Kendall Fuller and Cameron Curl both mentioned both of those guys corner and safety both free agents that's a place they need to attack I think in the in the draft they're going to come back and pick at 36 and then 40 and 67 pick 40 is from the Bears that was in the Montez sweat trade so they're feeling pretty good about that three picks in the top 40 yeah and six six in the top 103 yes so oh yeah if you go all the way six, to 103 there's, yeah. there's a lot to do there they have a lot of high value draft picks like almost six top 100 draft picks really close to that so yeah they they can do some real work um i think uh offensive and defensive line man if if they go edge if they do uh solidify edge in free agency i think there'll be some corner depth at 36 to 40 and 67 um they can get a sa a starting safety in there and then the offensive line depth you get a guy like graham barton from duke because they have they have a need at center and guard. Barton can do both. He played tackle at Duke. I think some people might even like him at tackle. I think he could be a really nice fit for them. Uh, Fontenot, who you mentioned from Washington a little bit earlier, if he goes early second. So the starting potential along that offensive line, there'll also be defensive think, line depth yeah, as well. There'll be some good edge rushers available at the top of the second as well. I think that that's the kind of area where you're either going to get you're going to get somebody for the trade. Some Chop Robinson in Washington. That's what I'm saying. Chop Robinson, Darius Robinson might be available at that spot. He's yeah, I mean, he could go in the first round at this point, but I, I think one of those trench spots will be available at the top of the second. All right, the more I'm talking through this uh, Lions type of rebuild here, let's get, let's get the trenches first. Let's get the O-line solidified. Let's get the D-line back on track in Washington, and then we'll get to the edges, get to the corners of the, uh, of the defense in particular later. They do have good receivers, though. Yeah. Terry McLaurin is a one. Jahan Dotson had a terrible sophomore year but showed a lot as a rookie i do think if you can tidy up the old line a little bit for this rookie quarterback you know if it's drake may he's got some dudes to throw to yeah in year one i mean the makings are there for that to be a good offense if they can solidify the line like brian robinson in the backfield is a good player as well i mean they have logan thomas is a good tight end they have weapons like they just need the foundation piece to it and you know, fear, who knows? They might use him as a bridge quarterback for a while anyway, so you might, it might be the same situation. But let's not forget that Sam Howell made that line look worse than it probably was because of the way he plays the game. All right, do we fix the commanders? At least got them pointed in the right direction. Pointed in the right direction. Gave them some options. It's going to take more than one, <laughs> one offseason, I think, a, to fix that team. Josh, 
It's a, it's a multi-year rebuild. Multi-year. Multi-year. Um, we did have some listeners because we had Rick Spielman on the show. We did have some people listen to Rick's answers because we talked about the quarterbacks. He has Drake May as QB too. It's good that somebody did that. Somebody, yeah. you know, somebody has takes. Who did listen to what he was saying? Yeah, somebody did. They, um, they looked into the fact that Spielman was a consultant during the coaching search mm. for Washington and said, well, he also has Drake May as QB too. Therefore, we're trying to connect the dots here that that means that they're drafting the, uh, Drake May at two. Right. I would not look too much into that. I mean, if you, did, if you do hear Rick talk about his time consulting, it is literally just consulting and saying, Here's, here are the strengths and weaknesses for the coaching and GM candidates. Here's what I think. And then other people are making those decisions. So, like, Rick's not in the building, in draft meetings. It's also February. So I would not look too far into what Spielman's QB rankings are for him as a content producer for CBS Sports and try to link that to what the Washington Commanders are going to do just because he's got, uh, you know, contacts in the building. Okay. Just wanted to preface that for everybody. Hmm. I don't know, I just saw it rather disappointing uh, throwing a damn cloth in the fire there. Should have been stoking that up. We're going, we had the oh. answers. Oh, okay, you're right. Yeah, Rick, I mean, look, Rick's in the building, and he's got Drake May number two. Therefore, that's who's going number two to Washington. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, I implore you, do not take things I've said on this show out of context and have it go viral after the show, but I'm, I'll keep my eyes peeled. Looking at you, Jets fans. What did I say, Jets fans? What David, did I say? David Ajoku called you out. Not me. Yeah, no, you. Yeah. Cited an article. Uh-huh. 30 MDS, you get 30% off pff.com right now. 30 MDS is your 30% off promo code. Um, we're going to do this. we got two more shows. We're going to do it Monday and Wednesday. Remember, back to three shows a week, but two more of these. We're halfway through the NFL, fixing every team in five minutes. LOL, JK. Uh, but Monday we'll do another two divisions and then uh, might pre-record one for next Wednesday for when we're... Head into Indy, Combine Week next week. All of PFF yep. is going. We're all going. So we're going to be there. So many awkward handshakes. Yeah? Yeah. We got fine Sando game. Yes. A lot of fun next week. Did I the win at the Super Bowl? You probably did. I think it was 3-2, right? He tweeted at me at the Super Bowl. I think that should count during the... No, it didn't. He said himself that didn't count. Sando can't make the rules. It feels like he was hiding more. Knowing that we, were I know. I do him. feel like that's the thing now. Yeah. Sando is now like he's now sensitive. Yeah, he's sensitive to his ability to he's, be everywhere. He's uh, he's cloaked, but uh, he's everywhere at the combine. He's right by the Starbucks. Every time you're walking through that hallway, you're going to see him. I don't know how often we're going to be there now if we're in an Airbnb. Oh, that's right. Um, that's going to put me way behind the Sando game. We are. I'm at, I'm at the JW. I know. I'm at the Good Hotel this year. Never been in that one. I mean, I've been in it, but I've never stayed. We did it. We stayed there one year. I didn't. Why not? You weren't there that year? No. Oh, yeah. The first year when they didn't know how expensive it was, right. and they just mm-hmm. just burning money. You've been in the JW. I've never I stayed have. in the JW. I have. I'm excited. I've never been there. It's I've been to be the good. gym in the JW. That's as close as I've been to it. You and Schefter. Yeah. You like and Schefter working out at 5 a.m. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I don't know how those people do that like every day. I can do it once and like, that's a stupid idea. Let's not do that again. And it's for like, show. They're doing it because the whole NFL is there. No. But they, are, they, are they out like, at, you know, are they out at night the way everyone else is as well? How do they, how do they survive? Shefty doesn't go out late night like that now. He doesn't need to. He's already got all the contacts. He does. He just texts people. Just texts, yeah, yeah, from his room. Probably at the JW. <laughs> from the JW. All right. Did we, did we forget anybody? I think it's good. Probably. All right. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. We'll see you again on Monday with more PFF NFL podcast.